Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. And I welcome all of you in the final event of the SCLS or Sustainable Chemistry Lect Lecture Series event. Together with my colleagues, uh, Professor Adam Slabon from Stockholm University and Professor Robert Franke from the Leibniz Institute of Catalysis started this lecture series in 2021, just one year ago. We have been able to invite pioneering chemists from around the world in the domain of sustainable chemistry. Our main interest was to reach to the younger generation to make them understand why we need sustainable chemistry and how we can attain this sustainability. This effort would not have been successful without a continuous support from Stockholm University, Antwerp University, Leibniz Institute of Catalysis, and Austrian Competence Center of Tribiology. We are immensely thankful to the Royal Flemish Chemical Society for their generous support, particularly to Thomas Franken for all the technical help. This lecture series would not be completed without the generous support from UCAMS. Particularly, I should take the name Professor Anna Aguirre Ricardo, the president of the Green and Sustainable Chemistry Division of UCAMS. We are very much thankful that Anna has been able to manage her time to attend this final event, and she's with us as well to share some of his. Uh, let's say, stories with us. We also thank to all the speakers throughout the year for sharing their chemistry with us. Thanks also to our speakers today, Professor Raul Banaji from ISAR Kolkata, India, Professor Lutz Ackermann from University of Göttingen, Germany, and Professor Jani Bagfall from Stockholm University, Sweden. But before going to the scientific part, I would like to invite Professor Anna Aguirre Ricardo, the president of the, uh, the Green and Sustainable Chemistry Division of UCAMS, and Anna, please, uh, the time is yours. Thank you. So good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it is a real honor to be here with all of you. Uh, I would like to start thanking uh, uh, the organizers, uh, Shubik, Howard, and Adam, uh, for organizing this uh, outstanding sustainable uh, chemistry uh, lecture series that started one year ago. Uh, more or less, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, you have been, uh, uh, this has been a, a successful story, I think, uh, because you could uh, um, uh, collect and invite such a recognized speakers um, that uh, uh, you really could have uh, a, a lot of attendees and uh, the European Chemical Society um, recognized immediately the, the importance and the, how it was important to support this event. Um, I also thank the, uh, uh, the opportunity uh, a, on behalf of the EUCAMS Division of Green and Sustainable Chemistry, uh, which I have the honor of being sharing this uh, last uh, three years. And um, I also think that uh, we are all aware of the importance of the, the contributions that we are all invited to, 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 to do and to, to make with the, for the world to do development of the sustainability. And um, this main, to contribute to this, I am happy to tell you that the division has, uh, in being enlarged uh, because the, during the last months there were more chemical societies that uh, um, came up and uh, have uh, representatives, new representatives in the division uh, of green and sustainable chemistry. So I believe that this will be uh, fostering more activities and uh, more um, participated uh, conferences and because we have a, a conference that we uh, organize each two years and I hope that uh, Shubik and uh, some others may uh, contribute uh, strongly for the organization of these uh, conferences in the near future. Um, 
last year it was in Greece, the fifth uh, uh, European uh, Green and Sustainable Conference of the, our division. Um, it was organized by, by Costas, um, but, but the next one are still under decision, uh, the place where it should be, uh, probably in Italy, but it's not sure. And the, the, that will be the sixth conference. And after that, it will be the seventh. So the sixth and the seventh, we still don't know exactly. So maybe uh, uh, Belgium, Italy, we will see. But I hope that you keep an eye on this subject and that we could uh, meet you all uh, in the next uh, uh, conference of the division. Also, um, I would like to, to tell you that we will have um, also in Lisbon uh, uh, this year, um, the, the eight, I'm not sure if, if I can show this. Can you see the slide? Yes, Anna, we can see. Okay, so this year, um, the, the Portuguese Chemical Society, uh, with the support also of the Electrochemical Society, uh, have the pleasure of organizing the 8th Eukem's Chemistry Congress uh, to be held in Lisbon uh, from 28th of September until the September 1st. Um, and uh, so I invite you all uh, to join us um, because I'm sure that it will be uh, uh, a great Congress and uh, you will all uh, enjoy uh, Lisbon and uh, the weather, the food, the, the, the Portuguese people as well. And, um, and this will be another contribution uh, for the networking, for collaborations, to foster scientific collaborations within the green chemistry field. And uh, so I hope that we all uh, commit more and more uh, to this final uh, goal that is uh, to have a, a sustainable development and uh, uh, a happy world. So thank you so much, Shubik, and uh, I wish, uh, I'm looking forward to listen to the speakers of today, so I don't want to take your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, for your continuous support and always motivating us. Uh, so, Esther, let's say, the leader of this uh, leader of this division, the Green and Sustainable Chemistry Division. So, you always encouraged us to organize this type of lecture series to promote sustainable chemistry. So, thanks for having you as the leader to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are also very much looking forward for the let's say sixth. Uh, green and sustainable chemistry event, probably in Italy. So I can already tell a little bit. <laughs> in 2025, it will be probably in Belgium. So this is how we are discussing at the moment. It's, yes. it's not yet fixed, but uh, yeah, so will surely be fixed very soon. Thanks also. So I also kindly invite for this uh, UCAMS event in, in Lisbon. You know, the UCAMS conference is always a great event for making all the network all the collaboration, scientific approach, non-scientific, all the you know, yeah. social events. So it's, it's fantastic. And if it is in Les Lisbon, then nothing can be better than that. So I, I encourage everyone to join this conference. With this, with now we need to move towards the scientific uh, part of this event, the final event. And our first speaker is Professor Rahul Banerjee. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Rahul Banerjee from Iser, Kolkata, India. Professor Banerjee has achieved his PhD degree from the University of Hyderabad, India, and subsequently he moved to University of California, Los Angeles, to work with Professor Omar M. Tiagi. So everyone knows him, and he's a phenomenal scientist in MOF and many other exciting chemistry. In 2008, he went back to India and joined the CSIR National Chemical Laboratory. It's one of the prestigious institute in India for doing basic or fundamental research. And then he moved to the Indian Institute of Institute of Science, Education and Research, which is known as, let's say, ISAR Kolkata in 2017. And since 2022, he is the full professor at ISAR Kolkata. This ISAR, I must also probably mention a bit, so all of you know probably, but some of you, if you don't know, so this ISAR's institutes, they have been built up very recently, I would say, let's say around seven to eight years ago. 
by the Indian government to promote more fundamental science. And Professor Banerjee is one of the, I would say, uh, the top fundamental scientists in India, in, in, in the world, around the world, I must say. So it's a perfect place to promote science, to do fundamental science, not only basics. So now uh, I can recall that, uh, so there is some innovation hub as well in Isar Kolkata. So it's a perfect place for doing research for the studies and they are also promoting, including the Indian government. So obviously the beautiful and pioneering chemistry that Professor Banerjee has achieved that earned a lot of success, a lot of awards. It's a big list. So I'm trying to make it a bit short. So for example, he has received the BM Birla Science Prize in Chemistry in 2015, Thomas Reuters Research Excellence India Citation Awards in 2015, Nasi Skupas Young Scientist Award for 2014 in the field of chemistry, Nasi Young Scientist Platinum Jubilee Award in 2011 in chemical science, and also Young Associate of the Indian Academy of Sciences. He became the fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, the FRSC well known, and he was also associate editor of Crystal Engineering Communications Journal. And currently he is the associate editor of the Journal of the American Chemical Society. So with this note, Professor Banerjee, we are very much looking forward to your pioneering chemistry and the screen is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, kind uh, you know, introduction, Professor Das. And uh, once again, I would like to thank um, all the organizers and also Professor Das and uh, and uh, the, his colleagues <clears throat> for this uh, for this organization and giving me this opportunity. It's a huge honor, uh, and uh, I have never been to been to Portugal. Uh, so if I get an opportunity, definitely in future I will uh, try my best. So. Uh, Today, I'm going to discuss something uh, related to a porous material, uh, and we will try to see if I can explain to you what are these porous organic nanotubes are, and uh, what are they good for, to be very honest, and what would be they good for. So two topics I'm going to discuss today. One is called the covalent organic frameworks uh, in, uh, in this slide, what you can see. And another one being the covalent organic nanotubes. This will be a very short one. This is just a recent work that we are doing, but I, you know, uh, how it prop, popped up from our earlier work uh, that uh, I'm sure you will be quite curious. So let us start. Uh, let us get an idea. What are the porous materials I'm talking about? Uh, we all know what are the porous materials are, the, the, the clothes that you are uh, wearing, they are all porous. Uh, in India, we use the water filters. Uh, you know, I, I am afraid, I'm sad to say that we don't have uh, exclusively very clean water available. So we need to use some water filters. So we use zeolites uh, in that and porous carbons as well, plus porous polymers. So as soon as you talk to a, a company or an industry about the porous material, first thing they will ask is that, uh, first of all, is it inexpensive? Is it cheap? Second is obviously, is it porous? Uh, otherwise, perhaps it won't be good for much. And the third being it's chemically stable or not. If it is not chemically stable, it is practically going to be useless for them. And uh, can we make it very quickly, fast and rapid synthesis and flexible membrane to, to do that? Of course, the crystallinity, something that I have added, uh, because if you have a crystalline material, I'm a crystallographer by training. training. I teach crystallography in the class these days. And uh, if you have a crystalline material, you exactly know what you have made and, and uh, whether you can change it, what are you changing and whatnot. So if we look into the porous material series, as I have discussed, there are uh, porous silica, uh, zeol you know, uh, zeolite materials that is available to us. The recent materials are the MOF materials that uh, I, will not be have, I will not have time to discuss, but it's a very, very important material that Professor Omar Yagi has invented in his laboratory when I was doing the postdoc, you know, the exclusive work was going on on the MOFs and ZIPs. And obviously the new one being the organic version of that where there aren't any metals, but it follows the same logic of the metal organic framework. I'm going to discuss this one today. So what exactly is the covalent organic framework? Very simple logic. You take uh, amine, diamine, it's a C2 symmetric and you have a C3 symmetric uh, aldehyde. I mean, not being fully C2 symmetric because there is a tetrahedral node, but for the time being, you look into it as a C2 symmetric compound and C3. 
you assemble a C2 and a C3 symmetric compound, and obviously they will take this kind of shape. It's a hexagonal structure. It's something like graphene. And then if you let these things assemble, uh, these will assemble on top of each other, like graphene to graphite. It's some sort of something reverse than the graphite to graphene. Just the drawing, I'm sure, is, it's just a chem draw. You know, this is drawing in a piece of paper. Just this drawing can tell you that there will be nice one-dimensional channel pore structures available for you to do something uh, of uh, your choice. So these materials can be made fairly easily, as I told you, that uh, just by mixing amine and the aldehyde, and uh, you can make this compound, you can precipitate it, and uh, you can then characterize using XRD, NMR, IR, etc. Once made, they are fairly indestructible. That means, obviously, they are very chemically stable, thermally stable, and so on. Of course, not stable in sulfuric acid, I mean, nitric acid or aqua regia, but otherwise fairly chemically stable. Many ways you can make the covalent organic frameworks. You know, earlier days, we used to show this picture to show the design. But these days, believe me, you can type in Google if you don't believe me. You can just draw a structure in a piece of paper, you know, these kind of things. And then you can go to the laboratory and really make it. Believe me, it has gone to that level. It has become so, so simple now. So this follows the same principle, like taking a joint, connecting with another joint, some kind of organic squad, and eventually you know, creating a framework out of it. So that's the beauty. How do we make it? Many different ways. I'm going to show you a few over here. You can see this is the boronic acid trimerization. Boronic, uh, boronate ester formation. And uh, I'm going to discuss about this ship based condensation today. You know, this has been discovered more than 150 years ago by Hugo Schiff, uh, a German scientist, if I have not made, if I'm not mistaken. I, mean, I must say that thank God he did it because otherwise I would have been, frankly speaking, jobless. So, what are the usage of this? Not going to advertise. Believe me, I don't need to. You just, uh, just use internet. And you will see there are hundreds and thousands of papers on covalent organic framework popping up everywhere these days. Everywhere. So membrane separation, heterogeneous catalysis, photoconduction, energy storage, and so on and so forth. So, not absolutely not going to advertise because just take a look at it in the internet and you should be able to find out. But these are all beautiful stuff. What are the challenges? What are the issues? Mm, uh, whatever I said so far, as if you know, it seems that you mix amine and aldehyde in a, in a pot or a round bottom flask, you will immediately get these beautiful framework structures. No, you won't. You won't do, you won't get that. Because as soon as you are going to mix amine and aldehyde, please note that they are not school children, that you ask them to line up and they will line up very nicely. They won't, they are uh, chemical uh, entities. The compounds, as soon as you mix them, they will assemble completely random manner and then for precipitate as this haphazard polymer, which will be, will be absolutely no good. So that is why uh, what we do is we use a process called, in order to you know, you know, avoid these, these random polymer formation, we go for a process called freeze pump thaw, not advertising at all, you know, don't try it in the lab. Because you know it is a it is a, such a difficult way to do. You have a, a you have a, a you have a container glass container where you uh, you put all these ingredients, add a high boiling solvent like DEF DMF, then do put everything into uh, liquid nitrogen. Then in that condition you do a, a flame sealing or sorry va va uh, vacuum. Then do a flame sealing and eventually you put that whole thing into 120 degrees centigrade temperature. There could be explosion and whatnot. And if that does not happen, you may get a tiny, teeny amount of compound at the end of the day, absolutely not worth it. So then about five, four or five years ago, I visited Tata Steel. This is their plant in Jamshadpur. No, I, am, I, am, I don't have to advertise them. These are the plants where the CO2 and all the gases are coming out. Can you, if you, if you want to see these days, when you see some, uh, some scale, People put a coin next to their material and show, and I'm putting next to a truck, next to this pipe, I'm putting a truck to showcase the, the structure of it. Look at the size, I mean. So they said that they're they are looking for a lot of porous materials, believe me. And then they asked and look at the, I looked at the pipe and I figured out that, I mean, come on. 
our children, our students' children, their children, and their children will keep on making covalent organic frameworks, and these pipe will never fill. So I don't want to use this freeze pump thaw is not going to work. No industry will ever be interested into into it. My students and my myself is not interested. So what exactly uh, is the solution? But let's keep that thing aside and let's see how many different ways you can make these beautiful materials. I mean, name it. You know, look at this. This uh, I mean, for a chemist, organic chemist, this will look like a gold mine. These are the different methods, by the way. Huh? So, and with that, you you know you you assemble. I mean, I'm not a synthetic organic chemist. Many of you are. How many different compounds that you can synthesize are synthesizing every day in your laboratory? And just mix these two opportunities together with your synthetic capability and the reported methods. I mean, think about how many covalent organic frameworks you can uh, you can uh, present to the world. Well, I think it sky will be the limit. So that being said, that is why. We got to find out a process to make this thing in bulk in this way and, and avoid, avoid this process completely altogether. And that is where that is where we thought that we need to think, you know, to rethink our design. So how do we rethink? You know, so first we figured out the reaction is too fast. Reaction is way too fast for us to control. And that's why you are getting this product. We need to slow it down. So how do we do that? After a lot of brainstorming, a lot of permutation combinations, we figured out that if we react an amine, which is the basic compound, with an acid, which is, of course, that acid, reaction between an acid and base will generate salts. And that will have a lots and lots of hydrogen bonding. Amine will be protonated. And eventually, that will react with the aldehyde. And, uh, and then that protonation, breaking of the protonation will give us a delay to eventually make these compounds into the hexagonal structure that we want. And uh, eventually that will precipitate out as a crystalline product. That was the idea. Of course, you know, ideas are ideas. You know, uh, they need to be worked out in the lab. So what we did is we did a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, um, uh, permutation combination, as I told you, few trial and errors. And we figured out that if you use the organic acid, which is paratoluene sulfonic acid, and react it with an amine, you produce these flaky or paste com kind of compounds. Think about it, you know, it's sort of like how you are making breads, you know, you, you mix ingredients, flour, water, and make a paste out of it. And then you put it into a preheated oven for some time and you get the cake or biscuits out of it. Exactly the same way we baked it and we could eventually make this covalent organic framework completely crystalline in manner. I mean, not going to discuss the thermodynamics. I don't have the time. If you have a little bit doubts, we can discuss that during the question and answer. And look at the surface area. I mean, look at the porosity of the materials, you know, 3,000, 3,500 meters square per gram. I myself was really surprised. Initially, I thought actually these are all, you know, we are actually joking here. But later we did multiple number of times and I'm so proud to say that we did this work from India and so many people uh, down the track last few years have followed this methodology and made these covalent organic frameworks in the bulk scale as well. So how did we come up with to this paratoluene sulfonic acid or these acids that we have talked about? Initially, we tried with nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and whatnot. Nothing worked. Later, we moved to acetic acid. No, absolutely no result whatsoever. Then we figured out that strength of the acid is the key. This is, it is the problem, and that is going to be our solution. So that is where we moved to a modest uh, PKA, a PKA and, uh, which is a moderate PKA, and that is where we figured out that, okay, this uh, is going to be the solution, and that's exactly worked. I mean, uh, you know, that gives me enough, you know, enough confidence on the scientific logic uh, uh, till today. So then we take the opportunity of uh, this pasty kind of material and made lots of different shapes and sizes. These are the ways we make uh, rice puddings in our uh, home. This is that small device where you put, uh, you know, ground rice and make some nice flakes out of it, and then you make. Uh, you put it into milk, boil it with water, uh, boil it, and then you make very nice rice uh, pudding out of it. And you can see these covalent organic frameworks. We took the advantage and made uh, lots of different shapes, sizes for uh, the Tata Steel. I'm running a project right now with them, and these are uh, some of their adsorption uh, profiles as well. So that was really, really challenging problem sorted out. Later, we moved to uh, phase two, uh, which uh, was with the Gas Authority of India Limited. And we did it with the twin screw extruder. And we put the ingredients. 
don't get too much excited about it it is just a very fancy equipment uh, but the the organization of your equipment is the very old indian type of masala making or curry making masalas for the curry where you have two screws goes one goes uh, in clockwise direction another goes anti clockwise direction and you put your ingredients and because of the frictions you make you get this compound and the crystalline material of course of course i acknowledge that the crystallinity is not as good as the ones we made in the oven process and the neither the surface area but it's still pretty handy about about 1000 meter square per gram as well please take a look at the stability i mean i don't have to exaggerate this is nine normal hcl you throw the material and keep it for a week week two weeks no problem you know sulfuric acid nitric acid they are not stable i will not uh, not uh, exaggerate over here but you know hcl absolutely no problem whatsoever so very high chemical stability of this material at that point you know i uh, was giving this lecture a uh, few places here and there and a lot of people ask me this question you know how do you really take this thing forward okay all right they are good porous material and so on and so forth what are you planning to do with it in the in the in the phase 2 so that time this article came to my uh, uh, note i mean and i looked into it this is a two dimensional graphene oxide you know and uh, we all know about graphene oxide this is a 2d material and using this material people have made lots of different morphologies of lots of different nanomorphologies out of it for example this is a zero dimensional morphology as you can see this is a one dimensional morphology this is a 2d this is a 3d morphology and all made from these uh, meet this graphene oxide and each one of these morphologies which is so interesting to see used for completely different you know uh, purpose for example this one for desalination this one is for you know dye separation oil separation and so on and so forth which is which is really intriguing for us and we thought that okay all right that's interesting let's take this you know we also have a 2d material we should be able to make similar morphologies as well like what they did over here and if we can do they should behave you know completely different way being they have made from the same ingredients we thought that okay let's give it a shot and this i'll explain to you in next uh, about maybe 5 10 minutes and then we'll move to the final part okay so i'll take you to to two uh, scenarios and we have named it as a reticular nanosynthesis you know using the ideas of reticular chemistry we are doing it let's see we took uh, one particular aldehyde this is the fluoroglucinol trialdehyde there are three phenols three aldehydes uh, next to each other okay and we took two amines same aldehyde and two amines so okay so let's see the scenario one what we did in scenario one is we took amine uh, amine in water this amine can be solubilized in water using little bit of paratoluene sulfonic acid amine in water and aldehyde in dichloromethane about 100 ml 100 ml solution of each and then what we did is we placed the dichloromethane solution in the bottom of a uh, round i mean uh, uh, beaker and then the water we slowly added drop wise on top this is a oil water mixture you know dichloromethane being oil and uh, water being water it will not mix and then there will be interface this is a well known phenomena in the polymer industry and polymer chemistry where people use this interfacial synthesis of polymers and synthesize a lot of different polymers for their uh, for different purpose so what we did is we just used the same methodology of interfacial synthesis but this time we could crystallize i mean i'm i'm you know once again very proud to say that we could crystallize without any heat temperature or whatever these you know 2d materials at the interface i mean heat being on room temperature of course there is some heat so these materials these polymers are uh, are uh, crystalline materials are synthesized in the in the in the surface or in the interface you can lift it we did lift it and we checked the surface area of these films and and as you can see these are very crystalline material films and also also they are quite porous nature as well then we did a, a fairly elaborate study and we found out that okay yes they are you know uh, films they are pretty large sized and uh, also there aren't any cracks provided you make it a uh, reasonable size you can make this film starting from around 20 nanometers to almost go to 2 to 3 micron size you know you can go to thin and you can go to thin thicker as well how do we make it how do we synthesize it and that's the first part of it so when you mix these ingredients uh, you know all these amine and the aldehyde 
then what you will start seeing is nice fib fibrillar morphology of the amine and aldehyde when it is in the interface. Okay, very nice fibrillar morphologies, one fiber, two, three, four, five. These are different fibers roaming around. These fibers will slowly start assembling with each other. And once they assemble, they will start taking the, the form of these films. So this is the fibrillar morphology converting into a film, sort of taking the bundles of, uh, of sticks and then assembling, let's say, a mat out of it. OK. Then what happened is the following. We, we of course, we traced it everything uh, via powder diffraction and, uh, of course, the IR and NMR as well. This is the thicker one. These are self-standing as well. You can lift it from the, from the solution if you want to. And these are two micron. I told you, you can make you know, thicker ones as well, very thick. And you can take these films and put it between two filter papers. And when you will run a different kind of solvents, of course, different sizes, based on the size, you can also do a size fractionation as well. Or you can do a, even a nanofiltration if you should wish to do that. Because very simple logic, you know, these have very nice ordered channels. And then through that, you will have the filtration. Remember, there will be an absorption parallelly as well. And it will slowly keep on absorbing. And at some point, will seep out. And, uh, but if you stop it before that, if you do backflash, you should be able to use this film for quite some time. We did around 50 to 55 cycles. We still figured out that it is fairly OK. But beyond maybe about 100, it will start seeping. So that part was also sorted. And these days, I'm trying to work out a little bit on the arsenic separation, uh, because this is a typical problem of the coastal Bengal and some of the other parts. It is not a global problem. It's a very local problem. And it is a horrendous situation. If I show you some of the some of the things that happen due to the arsenic, you know, arsenic, it goes directly to the uh, to your body, and it will never come out. And you will, you know, you will see what happens after two three years. And it doesn't happen all on a sudden, by the way. So we are trying to work out something. And uh, this is some of the films that we are making, and you know, probably long way to go. Okay. So moving on, scenario two. In the scenario two, uh, previously what we did, we took the amine into water, aldehyde in, uh, sorry, aldehyde being in the DCM. This time we took everything, amine, aldehyde, everything, and a little bit of acid, everything thrown into DCM, everything. And then placed some simple deionized water on top of it. No, I mean, nothing on the top. This time we saw something interesting. We saw that instead of the fibrillar morphology, these uh, reactants starts reacting and form these nice spheres, which will eventually form these films. So we are once again getting the films, but this time these films are made up of nanospheres rather than uh, nanofiber. We once again monitored with respect to the BET surface area and, uh, and of course the powder diffraction as well. As you can see, you know, seriously in the beginning, they will remain this kind of uh, nanofibular morphology and uh, nanosphere morphology. And here you can see they start doing reaction and eventually form these very nice films. We did a monitoring uh, with respect to dynamic light scattering, and we found out that, and also the ACM, look how they assemble you know, in a very nice ordered manner and eventually form the film. And that was really, really very, very interesting uh, for us. That same material, just a different methodology of synthesis is giving us different kinds of, different kinds of film. So that was wonderful for us to uh, note and uh, uh, very interesting uh, for us to understand as well. So now, obviously, you may probably ask me that, uh, OK, how are these films uh, assembling with each other? How is it exactly it is happening? Let me show you. So please take a look at it. These materials are synthesized, as I told you, that these are synthesized by the aldehyde condensation of aldehyde and amine. So once the aldehyde and amine starts doing the reaction, what would happen? Obviously, the ship base will form. But at the interface or the, at the surface of these nanospheres, this, you know, you may, you may not be very happy if I'm calling it as a nanospheres because they are probably about 200 nanometer size. Okay, all right, they may not be nano. So, uh, so these spheres, you know, at the surface of these, there will be all uh, lots and lots of unreacted, unreacted aldehyde and amine. So this aldehyde and amine will uh, start doing the reaction. You can monitor it via IR, uh, NMR as well. Uh, we couldn't do it by NMR, but we could do it via IR. And you can see with steps and steps forward, this IR, this amine and aldehyde peaks will slowly start disappearing and eventually the sheep base peak will start popping up. 
And that's when the film formation is complete. You can lift the film, as I told you, these are self-standing films, so there won't be much problem at all. So that is something uh, really an interesting piece of uh, observation. But the most important part that I want to emphasize over here is that we took <clears throat> same reagents, exactly same reagents all together. Uh, you know, here the aldehyde and the amine, but they are that just by using the two different reaction methodologies. What are these two reaction methodologies? Number one being uh, in one case, we have the amine in the water, aldehyde uh, and the dichloromethane layer. We started getting the fibers. These covalent organic frameworks will take the shapes of the fibers and these fibers will assemble and form a film. Then on the other hand, what we do have is that we do have a uh, amine and same aldehyde, same amine, but this time we have thrown everything into, uh, into the dichloromethane and there aren't any water or uh, two you know, layers on top, but we have added deionized water just to keep the double layer or bilayer. And this time all the uh, um, uh, covalent organic framework will take the shape of the nanosphere and this nanosphere will start assembling and form the film. That is so the same reagent is eventually giving you the same material film, nanofilms, but the process of the uh, synthesis is different. That's what uh, gave us a lot of, uh, lot of you know, interest. And we thought that let's try to find out a little bit about these films. What are these films all about? So once we did uh, the um, uh, powder diffraction and the uh, uh, surface area measurement, please take a look at it. As I told you, I emphasize again and again, the starting material being exactly the same and only and the product being exactly the same, they're still thin films. You can see these are films, these are self-standing films that we you know, made. And these films are also can be picked up. You can see that you know this has been held on a forcep. So uh, these are self-standing films as well, quite thicker ones. And you can make the thinner ver versions as well, around 300, you know, 400 nanometer thin. And these films are, do have different kinds of properties altogether. What different kinds? The different kind being that these films show, you know, when you make from the fiber to film, it show us a, a powder diffraction data, uh, reasonably similar to the uh, sphere, uh, the film which are made from the sphere. Though the BET surface area is a little bit different. In one case, we see a type four type of bias isotherm. In the next case, it is type one. So uh, the surface area is a little bit different. Uh, the porosity is also a little bit different. Though, please make a note that our, our uh, primary ingredients are exactly the same. The final uh, material being all the same in films, but the, the surface area and overall the properties are quite different. All, the, all we, we started seeing over here. And we thought that why is it? You know, after all, they are crystals; they have a long range periodicity. Uh, of course, they are polycrystalline powders assembled into a film, but they should have long range periodicity. So, what exactly is going on over here? So then, what we did is we started looking at it in a little bit close proximity. What do I mean by that? So we started understanding this whole process a little bit more, and we found out that well. When these films are assembling uh, into this interface, though we are uh, getting the fibers to form into the film, but, but there are lots and lots of defects. Whereas, whereas when we are getting these spheres to form the film, there aren't that many defects into the structure. Of course, this is, uh, this is just by scanning electron microscopy. They make no sense because, you know, scanning electron microscopy is taking a very tiny amount of space and uh, we are giving some information out of it. I mean, that makes literally no sense. Oh, we may be making a mistake. You know, we may be looking at a section where these spheres-based films look very good, whereas the fiber-based films look very bad. There could be another region where it could be vice versa. Yeah, yes, that was the question. So what we did is that, you know, all this, our huge logic that, you know, these fibers are forming this nice film uh, start, you know, uh, needs more uh, data, more experimentation. So what we did is we took a nano indenter. I started collaborating with my colleague, Malladeddy. So we took a nano indenter. It's nothing but that you have take the film, you took a, a, took a tip and you start putting a pressure onto your, you know, film. 
it's sort of like if you had a, a cake spongy cake and if you have a biscuit and if you take your finger and if you, even if you are blindfold if you poke, poke it with your finger you can immediately say that which one is spongy cake and which one is a biscuit biscuit being hard and the spongy cake being soft so what happened is that when you pushed these uh, fiber based films the nano inhibitor immediately went inside you know without much effort whereas when we took the same film same thickness we had to take the same thickness because please note that if you take a different thickness obviously your data will be different so we took a similar film uh, with a with a different uh, with a with a sim uh, same thickness made by different methodology of these nanospheres and the nano inhibitor starts getting a resist from the from the system itself so which was really surprising for us to see where we have the same basic you know ingredients final product being the same but the overall uh, process overall uh, uh, material or overall uh, behavior of the material is completely different just take a look at it won't bore you too much with the physical data take a look at it this is the depth and this is the load so for these uh, uh, sphere based films you know when you are giving the load load is going up you but you still don't move that much on the depth whereas on the same amount of load when you are giving the you know uh, fiber based films will move just like that it will just go in just like that you know that was really something very interesting but it is nano indenter it's much more thicker indenter it is almost the almost the tip radius is almost 1 micron so i was a very very confident that time that yes indeed it is a, it is a mesoscopic phenomena not some microscopic uh, some outlier kind of stuff that we are just seeing in the acm instrument and we are you know uh, getting very much excited about okay we did with and you know took a look at these impressions that these films uh, leave when uh, they go in and uh, they come out so that indicates that we have really done the experiment not that something some artifact will popped up from so i guess in the first part of this uh, this talk i could give you some idea that you know uh, you have a wonderful material in hand and you can you don't need to just stop at that stable these are the covalent organic frameworks you could take it one step further and you can also take the morphologies and also use them as ingredients to make different kinds of uh, different kinds of uh, bulk material as well so we sort of call it as a reticular and uh, nanosynthesis and uh, uh, using the ideas of reticular chemistry that was invented in uh, omori agu's laboratory so that time that time i started discussing with my colleague uh, 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 professor shyam sen gupta so that he is a, is a is a very good inorganic chemist they make this fe a b tamal based catalyst uh, very very well known where iron is in the plus 3 state they oxidize it make it plus 5 uh, iron 5 oxo uh, species and then they do a beautiful chemistry out of it so we said why don't we take this and absorb it into the sphere and then make the films out of it so once the spheres will form the film and uh, once the spheres will uh, will form the film and if we just load the catalyst into it so if we could load the catalyst into the sphere and uh, if the spheres form film then inside the film the catalyst will definitely be trapped it cannot come out of it and films as i have already given you so much ex example that you know like this you know these uh, films will uh, uh, you know uh, spheres will start forming the film and eventually they form a solid film out of it and the catalyst should be trapped and it should be accessible to all the ingredients then you know uh, should not be a problem there won't be any leaching for leaching effect and so on uh, well we thought that that will be interesting so we soaked these catalyst and into dichloromethane we made the film uh, we made the spheres took the sphere a uh, catalyst loaded sphere and then made the film out of it while making the film we found out something really interesting please see that look at this you know how these spheres are are um, you know sort of joining with each each each, each, uh, each other these smooth spheres as soon as they come in close proximity as if they are alive you know they start forming uh, this entanglement and eventually that goes to the film so you can imagine from this to that i mean how many times i have not seen this kind of morphological transmutation that often uh, in my career you might have i am not very sure about it. so what we thought that okay if we have the catalyst loaded here that will be very interesting because this this catalyst then can't, can't come out can't leach out and they are now trapped inside the film so that will be really interesting so 
So in that case, how much time do I have? Maybe about five minutes, if I am not mistaken. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Please, please okay. go. Ahead. Okay. So, <clears throat> so then uh, that is interesting part. <clears throat> so what he did? Excuse me. So this is, I mean, we were, I was really excited to see this. So first we loaded these FEB Tamil catalyst into these uh, spheres, took this particular sphere and did some nice catalysis out of it. You know, these spheres were very nicely dispersible in, in uh, acetonitrile uh, water mixture. And we could do this uh, three to two catalyst and you know, this nice CH activation. I'm not a catalyst guy at all. So I was really surprised to see these this spheres work very well. But, these spheres, after a while, starts uh, coagulating, you know, so they will come in close proximity, they will react, and they will precipitate out. About eight to 10 cycles maximum we could do, five would be the best, but after five we start seeing, you could see the yield and all starts dropping. Then we thought, okay, that's not working very well. Okay, so we went back to our original idea to sphere to film. Then we thought that, okay, so if we take the spheres, and if we take the uh, sphere and make a, make a film out of it, so then it should be fine. So you can see these spheres form the film. So that is, that is really, really interesting. So the catalysts are all loaded inside the sphere. And this sphere has now converted into a film, which is also loaded with catalysts. Now this time we took this and just threw into water or acetonitrile. <laughs> and uh, this, this was in completely in water. And they work, and these reagents, this, this FEB Tamil catalyst, if you know about it, it, it oxidizes actually water. It, it starts working, you know, reacting with water, and it's not very stable in water because, uh, not because it is, it will leach out, but it will start oxidizing water. So it doesn't work with any organic reagents when it is in water. And organic reagents are also fairly insoluble in water. You know? So, but here, these organic reagents, it sort of like got trapped into this, into these films, which is sort of like a oily, kind of stuff or sort of a oil in water separation. So where it got absorbed into this and then eventually started, started doing the reaction. So that was really sort of an interesting part. We put it into a, we made a thick membrane out of it and then do, uh, did this flow chemistry. And we did, we found out that around about 50 cycles. I know those who works on flow chemistry will really laugh at it. But in this catalyst product film after 50 rounds of cycle, same reagent, you just keep on pumping it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then after 50 cycles, we could around 80% uh, yield as well. So this was really interesting. And, and as I told you that I'm not a catalysis person and you know, I look forward to some collaboration on this. And I think there is a huge opportunity. So I'll finish in, let's say in five minutes, uh, uh, we'll showcase something new uh, material that we are trying to develop in our laboratory. I, I give these uh, talks because you know, uh, we cannot do everything on, on our own. We need to collaborate with each other. And then I encourage collaboration and I love to do collaboration. If you have any ideas, we would love to work on it. Anyway, moving on. So these are allotropes of carbon. Okay, okay. We know about it. I don't have to go into detail. There are some synthetic variants of it. You know, those, uh, please note that they are not the replacements of it, but there are some synthetic variants. If you take the fullerene, which is the zero dimensional one, you have these nice organic cages made from this uh, same amine uh, bonded reaction. These are the organic cages. And these organic cages are, are, are zero dimensional in nature. They will assemble into, into the solution. They're absolutely, they're solution processable organic cages. Absolutely zero dimensional in nature. Then you have the covalent organic frameworks, which are 2D in nature, sort of resembles graphite. Okay, this graphite being also 2D layered by layer. Look at the structure also very much different, uh, uh, very much on the similar line from the graphite. Then you have the diamond, you know, which is a three-dimensional structure. Also, you can make the covalent organic frameworks, which are three-dimensional in nature. They're very robust, very strong in nature. And this is the synthetic variant of it. Please note that I'm not saying that they are the replacements. Absolutely no. They're just a synthetic sort of a synthetic analog of it or sort of a synthetic mimic. Let me put it in this way if you are too much conservative on that. What about the one dimensional one, carbon nanotube? At least I couldn't find out anything in the literature. So that time, you know, about two, three years ago, we started working on it and worked rigorously on this with this concept of, if you take a bent amine with a particular bent geometry, you know, this is the tip-tis, tip-tis and react with this aldehyde, 
you should be able to make a tubular structure of your of your own this should form a tube okay this looks very beautiful in the piece of paper but as soon as you start making it it will go in every direction and you will immediately get a uh, get a haphazard polymer precipitate and we kept on getting polymer and we, it was really frustrating eventually after a lot of effort we could finally make these uh, tubular structure look at this you know beautiful uh, beautiful tubular structure and then we could also uh, characterize them with respect to solid state nmr this is the ship based reaction if you are seeing this ship based reaction if you are still thinking that why on earth is aldehyde uh, peak is popping up let me know during the time of discussion we can discuss they are porous in nature and and also we also did uh, uh, afm imaging to find out that they are really a tube not some garbage that you can you can see over here and you can see this is a very nice tubular structure initially i thought it is just a precipitate or some artifact or something so but later after doing a lot of effort we could establish that they are indeed really tubes and these tubes not only remain and they starts intertwining like old days when we used to have the cord based telephones like for example in my telephone over here these cords so they starts inter intertwining with each other and and precipitate uh, uh, from the from the solution they are fairly stable in in water acetonitrile dichlorobenzene so you know we could uh, we could make these in many different solvents and precipitate them out and and uh, and which is precipitated them as well not only that these tubes you know they they take like a like a rubber band they take the shape when you leave them into the solution for a longer period of time they sort of starts forming these kind of toroid type of uh, compounds and you can see so many of them that's what i told initially i i said that uh, you know we got something bogus this is bogus data you know this has to be bogus so but then after a lot of effort my student kalipodo he proved that you know these are indeed formation of the tubes and these tubes also form the from the toroids uh, as well what is the use of the tubes and the toroids so far i am yet to explain to you we are working on it this is a brand new result so i thought that i will take the opportunity and liberty to share it to it uh, with you so that's pretty much what i wanted to uh, wanted to discuss uh, today uh, i hope uh, it was not too boring uh, if it is i apologize for that uh, i must acknowledge my students uh, they, and i have a very small group at isa isa kolkata i thank uh, my collaborator thomas haine he is in tru dresden now matt uh, he is in uh, nottingham trent university uh, matt was a postdoc with thomas and professor kharul with whom we did the separation experiment my colleagues at ncl ravi broto at iit kharagpur uh, a lot of help with the afm data professor malladi with whom we have been doing the nano indentation study ajit being a big help uh, for the solid state nmr we don't have a solid state nmr at isr paulo with whom we are working right now uh, for some a very nice work on this uh, you know uh, nano mechanical mapping of these tubes and shyam uh, you know good friend colleague uh, with whom we are working on this efi tamal based catalyst he is an expert of this efi tamal based catalyst so i took something from him and my students just uh, worked out that as i told you these are my students greatly acknowledge uh, himadri and koushik himadri is with uh, frank glorious now he is doing a, a post doc uh, koushik will be leaving tomorrow to uc barclay and these are the rest of the students so deeply acknowledge my my funding agencies my umbrella institute csir department of science and technology acrb icr kolkata and finally you know once again to the organizers uh, shobhik for the kind uh, invitation uh, and uh, and uh, to all of you for your patience and i look forward uh, if you have any questions thank you very much yeah. thank, you. thank you very much professor banerjee so it's a very inspiring chemistry so Uh, you. you know, I mean, I also work a little bit on heterogeneous catalysis. Probably you can you can check your inbox. You have already received an email from me. <laughs> Materials looks very interesting, and the applications yes, yes. that you uh, started to find out it's it's really encouraging. Uh, obviously, there are many questions, so I do have many questions, but I don't uh, think I'll be able to ask all the questions. But just want to start some questions, uh, as you have the experience with MOF. and cough i i guess this question you you often you get that from the audience so in the aspect of stability how do you let's say how do you keep this cough materials yes let's say about the water stability because many yes. of the morph particularly when i try to do reaction with let's say water based chemistry 
so mop is mop doesn't work properly to be yeah. there are some mops they are stable but this these are exceptional yeah, yeah, but yeah, how yeah, is the stability yeah. on the cough yeah 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 they are uh, they are very stable believe me they are very stable in uh, in water water if you are working they are very very stable i mean they you won't have a problem if you are working with a little bit of acid also there is absolutely no problem base sometimes sodium bicarbonate and all really okay but if you are really working with sodium hydroxide and all yes no uh, they want to be won't be very stable but otherwise you know they are very very stable they they could be very uh, likelihood uh, uh, they would be very good scaffold for uh, for the heterogeneous catalysis so we have started and i could see already so many papers you know every day uh, mm. on the heterogeneous catalysis on the covalent organic framework mm. and most of the covalent organic framework heterogeneous catalysis that we see has been made in our lab but you know probably we we took uh, we were uh, we were a bit late uh, uh, to to start the process but uh, i still believe that a lot of things could be done and if anybody is really interested i will be more than happy to 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 collaborate I mean, as i said already if there without stability no problem absolutely no problem okay so i have many questions but uh, i do see one question from adam actually so uh, adam is hesitating because of the voice so his question is cough thin films is this the future of gas separation there has been quite so quite a bit of work uh, uh, jurgen karo and uh, some of my other colleagues uh, uh, from all over the world they have been using these thin films uh, grown on uh, on the on the surface of alumina alumina and other and been doing a very uh, excellent work on the gas separation as i told you i don't have any facility of as such uh, at my place so uh, so yes uh, there could be a very high opportunity believe me because uh, because of the stability and uh, of these materials when you are making a film by the way please you have to keep it a little bit in mind that during the pressure of the gas it should not uh, fracture there should be you know, should not be a pinhole there should be should not be a crack uh, then there it really don't work otherwise it could be a very very beautiful material for the gas separation you know uh, if we explore it a little bit hard and little bit carefully it could uh, really showcase a lot of beautiful properties on the gas separation some of these i i see <clears throat> almost every let's say week couple of weeks new map papers are popping up on uh, gas separation and cops yeah robert yeah. <clears throat> yeah thanks also from my side for the brilliant talk um so i also have a, a question uh, regarding the stability of these materials and also um, regarding the pore size distribution. So we have shown uh, that you can use them in solution for filtration approaches. And, and, and uh, I think in, in for nanofiltration, you need very high pressures uh, and you, have, you, you didn't use the support. So how do these materials react towards pressure? Okay. This would be my, mm -hmm. uh, my first uh, uh, question. And, and the other question would be, how do the pore size distribution co uh, compared to standard materials? I, I think this is the advantage of these materials that you can tailor these, these pore sizes. Uh, Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, well, both are uh, excellent questions, uh, Robert. Thank you. So first thing is that regarding the nanofiltration, you know, uh, what we did uh, is very simple thing. You took the nanoparticles into, let's say, water, and uh, then you use a syringe filter. We just use a simple syringe filter and give a pressure. There, the pressure is not much. It's about 1.5 bar, two bars, give and take, you know, just a, just a syringe free filter. Mm -hmm. And you could see that the, uh, the nanoparticles of size around, let's say, two to three nanometer is coming out and rest is getting stuck over there. So, and that gives me more, in, uh, uh, more uh, confidence saying that there are not everywhere into the film, but in the some zones, you have definitely a, a, an oriented layer through which the filtration is happening. Rest could be some cases absorption, some cases filtration, but some zones definitely are there where there is a nice growth has happened where through that uh, mm. a nanofiltration has occurred. That is the point number one. Otherwise, if you want to do a large scale nanofiltration, you will need the larger pressure, larger membrane and so on. Uh, whether it will work or not, I do not know. Uh, but for a smaller scale, it worked fairly well in our laboratory. Uh, there was no problem whatsoever. Now, but uh, going back to the uh, phase two uh, is that if you want to do a larger scale, I would personally feel that it should be uh, it should be worthwhile to grow it on a support so that you don't get a uh, rupture or something during the pressure and self standing ones will prone to be ruptured because after all these are crystalline materials there will be grain boundaries there will be pinholes there will be fractures so this could be an issue but i would suggest mm -hmm. that we grow it on a surface that is uh, on a support so let's put it in this way 
and you can go for it. So this is first thing. The second one regarding the pore size distribution is a very important question. Please note that the way I have drawn these pictures as if that these cough materials are very nicely organized on top of each other. All the pores are stacked very beautifully on top of each other and there is no problem whatsoever as if they're like a very nice single crystal. It's not. They're polycrystalline powders. There are defects. There are grain boundaries over there. And as a result, this pore size is not exactly that what you are looking at right now. Mm -hmm. So there will be always, each and every layer, there will be always a little bit of zigzag. So eventually, whatever pore size you see in the model, model uh, we, can, we can model these structures and you can do a red belt refinement. But still, whatever pore size you will get, your realistic pore size should be much less than that. Much means, let's say, at least about half a nanometer mm, plus minus because of this, because of this zigzag nature of these pores. So you will always have a little bit of movement of these structures and you will have a little bit of compromise in the pore size as well. So these two factors, you need to keep in mind. They're not as good as MOF in terms of pore size. MOFs are very beautiful in that way. And uh, zeolites are even better, but they're not as good as that. But uh, otherwise, they're pretty interesting in terms of pore size. Yes, if we can organize that, if you can work within that boundary, should be fine. That's what I believe. Very final question. Anna. Thank you. Will you please ask the question by yourself or I will read that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, if I saw correctly, uh, I'm, in the reaction of the aldehyde with the amine catalyzed by the sulfonic acid, do you always need to have a fully substituted aromatic ring? No, 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 okay. no, 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 you don't, you don't, you okay. don't. Neither on the amine aldehyde part or uh, nor on the, on the other side. If you do have, let's say, teriphthaldehyde, teriphthaldehyde, uh, then yes, you can still get it, uh, get it, but but teriphthaldehyde it won't work. So my colleagues have done it. Uh, I if I remember properly, I think I saw uh, recently a paper with with um, dimethyl teriphthaldehyde or dimethoxy teriphthaldehyde and reacted with an amine where they have used this uh, sulfonic acid and they made a very nice film out of it. The pre study was a little bit uh, uh, not uh, uh, excellent, but otherwise they could make the covalent organic ring. No, not always. You need, don't need, okay. need it always. always. Thank you so much. It was a excellent, excellent talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Benaji, for this very, very pioneering chemistry, for all the discussion. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we are very much looking forward uh, to you. meet with you in person. Okay. Now I hand over to Robert. Robert, please. Thanks, Shoup. Uh, so we are five minutes behind schedule, but I think this is totally fine. And the five minutes were well, absolutely worth it, I would say. Uh, so let's continue with our next speaker. It's my pleasure to, uh, to, to introduce Lutz Ackermann uh, from Göttingen University uh, here in Germany. Um, so there uh, he currently fulfills a triple role. So as a full professor for one, so the second one is the director or as a director of the Böhler uh, Research Institute for Sustainable Chemistry. And the third role is uh, as a PI at the German Center for Cardiovascular Research. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, Lutz received his uh, master's degree or diploma, how we called it earlier here in Germany, uh, from the U University of Kiel, uh, which is in the very north of Germany. Then he moved to Mülheim uh, to carry out his PhD studies uh, under the supervision of Alois Fürstner uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Coal Research. Then uh, he moved to California uh, to work as a postdoc uh, in the group of Robert Bergman at UC Berkeley and afterwards uh, returned to Germany uh, to start his independent career uh, at LMU in Munich um, uh, as a Eminuter Fellow. So this was a starting point for an extremely su uh, successful research program, which I think most of us know pretty well. This was focused on organometallic catalysis and in particular uh, on developing leaving group free coupling reactions that uh, proceed via CH activation. So the period in Munich was uh, followed by a relocation to Göttingen, uh, where he was uh, appointed as a full professor at Göttingen University, and where he is still active uh, with his group uh, today. So in the past years, uh, Lutz continued to uh, develop his projects in the field of CH activation, but also successfully branched out into new areas, into photochemistry, uh, flow chemistry, peptide chemistry, computational chemistry, and recently also into electrosynthesis. And there, we will be able to witness uh, some of his results soon uh, in this talk. 
Um, uh, Lutz research was also acknowledged uh, with uh, numerous awards, uh, fellowships, uh, and guest professorships. Uh, and for the sake of our time, of our schedule, I will mention only a few of his uh, successes. So uh, from the ERC, Lutz received both the Consolidator and the Advanced Brand. Um, over the past years, he was continuously among the Web of Science uh, highly cited researchers. So the, the uh, AstraZeneca Excellence Award in Chemistry um, was also uh, among his disting uh, distinguishments and uh, along with the Gottfried Wilhelm uh, Leibniz Award from the German Research Foundation, uh, which is the most prestigious German science award, not chemistry, but science. So uh, before the people, uh, before you become impatient, I rather stop now, finish the introduction and hand over to you, Lutz, please, uh, the screen is yours. Lutz, could you switch on your microphone? Lutz, you are muted. Oh. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for the kind uh, um, introduction and also for the invitation to speak here. It's a real pleasure and honor. And uh, <clears throat> as has been indicated, um, we have been interested in bond activation. And in the context of this, I would like to <clears throat> share with you today our results on um, CH activation by electrochemical means. Okay, for the last... Um, Two decades, we are interested in using CH bonds as latent functional groups to reduce the number of steps involved in the synthesis, but also in the terms of sustainable chemistry to reduce the amount of byproducts that is formed in uh, classical transformation so that we can consider CH functionalization and particularly CH activation, which I want to focus on as a tool to improve sustainability. Usually, um, I could speak long time in, uh, of this research of uh, two decades almost on, on the mechanistic aspects, but today I would like to focus in the context of sustainable chemistry on one specific aspect, and that is how we can improve this um, manifold as such that we not only avoid uh, these stoichiometric byproducts and the synthesis of these two starting materials, but at the same time, have ideally substrates that are completely devoid of any leaving groups. So to say, to perform fully dehydrogenated couplings. And as you <clears throat> may know that uh, these metal catalyzed reactions, particularly of unactivated CH bonds are typically not that easy and they do not uh, proceed directly, but we need a stoichiometric chemical oxidant. And this is often, um, for instance, uh, silver one salt uh, quite frequently. It can be sometimes copper two, but <clears throat> it can be also hypervalent iodine, for example. And this leads in the CH activation stoichiometric amounts of byproducts, which um, if you want to perform this on uh, scale in the industrial environment can be prohibitive and is jeopardizing the inherent uh, sustainable nature of CH activation. Among a research program also involving photocatalysis, we became interested in analysis of cost of goods of this kind of oxidizing agents. And that is shown here <clears throat> in that these are typical oxidants. I hope you can see it starting with typical hypervalent iodine reagents or silver salts on a, a three millimole scale. So you can uh, obtain this data depending on on the scale you use. If you want to have more detailed information, I refer you to this review article. But the outcome of this is that in contrast to these chemical oxidants, electricity compares favorably. Um, that holds not only true for oxidants, but <clears throat> likewise for reductants, which I'm not going to discuss today about, um, <clears throat> where different challenges need to be met in the future for uh, addressing sacrificial anode procedures. But <clears throat> I would like to emphasize this approach, particularly with respect to sustainable use of renewable forms of energy. So this is an older slide and I apologize for it being partly in German, but it shows that the majority of renewable energy sources that we have available <clears throat> are not only uh, sunlight, but also wind energy. And I personally come, as you have heard from the Northern part of Germany. So I have a strong, 
strong desire to develop sustainable methods that can make use directly of wind energy at the, at the coast. <clears throat> if you're interested in, um, in, in this topic, uh, this is a recent uh, book I had the pleasure to edit and uh, contribute to, and, and also the chairman of this um, <clears throat> session here today, uh, which I highly acknowledge um, the contributions for. Well, electrosynthesis is, um, is a field that has uh, evolved from the early findings, let's say, of Walter Faraday and Heinrich Kolbe, up to reactions such as the Shono reaction. This is one representative example in which, for instance, the rather weak bond in the alpha position of the nitrogen can be functionalized, and it can be functionalized without any transition metal since it's uh, the bond dissociation energy towards the oxidation and the nucleophilic attack is rather low. All of this research can be also considered in terms of um, uh, coupled or non-coupled electron and proton transfer steps. Um, yeah, we are very much excited about electrosynthesis and electrocatalysis because you may not know, but uh, Professor Kolbe was actually studying chemistry here at the University of Göttingen with uh, Friedrich Wöhler and another important figure in the field, uh, Professor Schäfer did his early studies during the habilitation at our university on electrosynthesis. And there are many important contributions. I mentioned already Hans Schäfer, <clears throat> but also in the recent years, many important contributions in the field. Now, the stage was set, so we wanted actually to move away from um, substrate control so that the substrate dictates that the CH activation occurs here at the weakest uh, link, if you want, and we wanted to stir away the selectivity by combining electrosynthesis with metal catalysis. And that is non-trivial because the reoxidation step that is involved, for example, of the, of the uh, transition metal catalyst uh, uh, could be jeopardized by a cathodic reduction. So the control of these two half um, reactions uh, to engage in an electrocatalytic manifold uh, was by far not trivial and <clears throat> is in contrast to these metal free transformations. Well, right at the outside, we were um, for a long time actually very much excited about uh, not using uh, precious transition metals, which are shown here in the upper row, so 4D or 5D transition metals, but rather uh, base metals. And one aspect is that the cost of goods, which is given per the ounce of metal, is beneficial for those. Uh, the only exception is iron, where it's the cost of goods per ton of the metal. But in addition to that, they are largely not endangered, if you want to use that term. And more importantly, this is the data from GSK, and that shows that uh, most of the transition metals can be used, but uh, distillation is uh, largely required to remove trace metal impurities that would otherwise lead to faults, um, for instance, bioactivity data. So <clears throat> therefore, we set out uh, and asked us the question, is it possible to combine the use of sustainable energy form, for example, wind or solar energy, with the use of a base transition metal to activate strong CH bonds? And <clears throat> to do so, uh, at the one start of our project, we became uh, intrigued by the versatility um, of cobalt catalysis. And this, for example, is the amount of cobalt at that time that you could uh, purchase for 100 euro compared to uh, ruthenium, palladium, iridium, or rhodium. So there's a benefit of cost of goods. And in addition to that, it proved to be viable to do cobalt catalyzed um, CH oxygenations here. So let me guide you uh, step by step maybe through what I want to discuss here. First of all, we have a substrate <clears throat> that is a substituted amid, and we do electrocatalysis without an additional uh, electrolyte other than the carboxylate. So the carboxylate is needed, as I will discuss a little bit later, more for the CH activation, but also serving to adjust the conductivity. We did the reaction actually with cobalt acetate. And for those of you who are interested in CH activation chemistry, it's notable because many of the published procedures require CP star cobalt three systems, which are um, actually the CP star, it's almost as expensive as, as uh, the, the palladium catalyst. 
But uh, here you can use simple cobalt acetate. And why that is, I would like to uh, share with you uh, in due course. I should mention that at the beginning, uh, we utilized the divided cell setup to control the cathodic or potential cathodic uh, reduction of the metal. But uh, for the scale up already of this uh, contribution five years ago, we showed that this is possible also in the undivided cell setup, particularly if we use non precious cobalt catalyst. The reaction works at room temperature. And as you can see, we have no chemical oxidant. The only byproduct that is formed is molecular hydrogen. As the electrodes, it's a carbon uh, electrode, and to control the overpotential uh, for hydrogen formation, we have a cadmium cathode. The reaction is rather versatile, so you can um, <clears throat> tolerate a variety of important electrophilic function groups, such as a bromide, iodide, a thioether, which is oxidation sensitive, as is uh, inolizable ketone, but you can also have a, a nitrile or an ester. So many oxidation sensitive groups are tolerated, but also functional groups that you can use for further late stage diversification of functions. In addition, already in this work, we showed that you can use this for aromatic, so arene functionalization, but also for alkyl substitution. And if you use an alkene here, you have full control of the diester selectivity. So we do not observe any uh, diester mixtures, but you get selectively the set. Um, alkene. Now, how do these reactions work? We, we <clears throat> considered them in the context of renewable forms of energy, uh, of course. This was from an early uh, review. And the original uh, proposal was that we have a cobalt 3 catalyst that somehow, I will come back to that, but coordinates the alcohol that undergoes a reductive elimination to form a cobalt 1 species. That then undergoes um, <clears throat> uh, product formation and a reoxidation. So this is the reoxidation step of cobalt one to cobalt three. And in terms of um, a green hydrogen economy of the future, this can contribute a synthetically useful oxidation reaction that could be utilized for an infrastructure for cathodic uh, proton reduction. These reactions, I should mention, um, uh, subsequently, we uh, uh, wrote this article here, which also shows uh, the use of commercial uh, equipment uh, that is uh, yeah, commercially available. So this is CO bond formation. We also succeeded in using uh, simple cobalt acetate for CN bond forming uh, transformations. As you can see here, we have slightly elevated temperature now. The best conditions were identified with uh, gamma valerolactone, which is a renewable uh, solvent, can be derived from lignin. So we use a renewable forms of energy, as I will show you also later, uh, sustainable earth abundant metal to do CH activation in a renewable solvent. And <clears throat> to give you some ideas uh, how these reactions can be studied analytically, so this is uh, work where we did in Operando. Uh, infrared spectroscopy to uh, analyze the kinetics of these reactions. So we can do CO bond formation, CN bond formation, and also CC bond formation. In this case, um, we chose again, so we have a carbon uh, based um, anode, control the overpotential with the platinum uh, cathode at room temperature. We can form these uh, uh, annulated. Uh, products and the reaction works as such that again hydrogen is the only byproduct which you can use for <clears throat> subsequent pers uh, purposes also in terms of if you want uh, paired electrolysis. We choose this hydrozides because we could develop a, a protocol, a strategy how to cleave them uh, electro chemically, and this reaction works with internal alkynes. You can see here, even with acetylene, that's very exciting because here, finally, you have a homogeneous catalyst, the heterogeneous surface, and the gas, so the three phasic systems. Um, as you can see here, we have an uh, internal alkyne and fully reaches selective uh, reaction. And the same one's true if you have an unsymmetrical internal alkyne, you get high elements of regio selectivity. The mechanism 
<clears throat> for this CC bond formation is somewhat similar to the one that I've shown you before. So we have a, a proposed cobalt three intermediate, which undergoes now insertion with an alkyne to form the seven membered metalla cycle. Now reductive elimination generates a cobalt one that can be re-oxidized at the anode. In terms of green chemistry, uh, it is important that again, the only byproduct is green hydrogen. How do we arrive at such a mechanism? For example, by mass spectrometry analysis, ECMS, we can uh, detect this cobalt uh, metallocycle. We did DFT studies in our group to understand the regio selectivity or the whole catalytic cycle, including ideally um, potential crossover scenarios. But the regio selectivity can be explained. Uh, among others by weak dispersive interactions. And here's a transition state structure that shows the favorable formation of the product with the arrow group being proximal to the amide. Since this is somewhat <clears throat> chemistry that we developed over the years, uh, it's, it's, uh, I would like to summarize this part in that we can use cobalt acetate, inexpensive cobalt acetate, for CH activation, it forms CO bonds, CN bonds. I talked about the CC bond formations. But we could also show that isocyanides or uh, carbon monoxide can be used, uh, or that you can use an alene. And there, of course, elements of stereochemistry and radio uh, selectivity are very interesting in the formation of these products. But in the interest of this uh, talk today, I would rather like to emphasize that indeed, according to Rocky, don't use it, reuse it. We can use a solar panel or a windmill to drive these reactions. If you're interested in this, this is the, the corresponding reference. So you can either use a small windmill to fully uh, perform these reactions, or if you want, you can use a solar panel. And this reaction was actually done on the shortest day of the year, so on 21st of December 2018, before the pandemic. Well, um, benefits of this approach compared to other external stimuli may include that you can dial in the potential. There's an older potential start. You can use a uh, <clears throat> more recent uh, uh, one, a commercially available one. But you can select the potential where you want to go what reaction you want to achieve and what is the chemo selectivity or such. And that contrasts largely with the use of sustainable energy with these photo redox catalysts where you need a specific wavelength and have a uh, specific uh, redox potential that results from these catalysts. Um, well, so the mechanism. <clears throat> yeah. We were very interested in how exactly these reactions proceed. And so far it was more like a comic with some color circles, if you want. But we wanted to take a closer look actually what is occurring here. How do these reactions proceed? So to do that, we did stoichiometric reactions. And at the outset, we took the cobalt acetate, applied uh, potential, in this case, uh, potentiostatic uh, setup with a three electrode system that showed that uh, with one farad per mole, you can transform the substrate and the cobalt catalyst or cobalt pre-catalyst, I should rather say, to these catalytically active species. Now this, as you can see here, um, hopefully, is a cobalt-3 species that has actually more than one substrate coordinated to it. We could obtain an X-ray crystallography um, analysis. So it's an X-ray structure. It's not an animated calculated structure. And with this complex in hand, we could study its redox potential. As you can show here, depending on the wavelength, you get a nice reversible um, <clears throat> uh, scenario. And the same was true if you go to lower reaction temperatures, uh, again, uh, uh, scan rate dependence, but at a typical 100 meter volt per second, you get this reversible redox event, which was strongly indicative of a scenario in which we have an active cobalt-3 species that is oxidized to cobalt-4 in a reversible fashion. Now, to put this hypothesis to the test, we performed stoichiometric reactions with this cobalt complex 
And if you <clears throat> use this cobalt complex in a stoichiometric reaction, the reaction works if you apply it potentially. But if you have this cobalt three complex and you do not apply any oxidizing power, you do not form the product. And that implies, uh, in addition with these DFT studies, that the preferred pathway is an oxidation-induced reductive elimination. In this case, on the doublet surface in which the cobalt three is first oxidized by this transition state structure to cobalt, uh, to, to this co cobalt four, which is then undergoing reductive elimination. So this was some important mechanistic insights, which indicated that we have an oxidation-induced reductive uh, elimination. Okay, this manifold also applied to nickel catalysis. So here we have a secondary alcohol. Actually, this is a very challenging reaction, most directly hindered, didn't work with cobalt. As you can see here, also not only cobalt didn't work, also manganese, copper, ruthenium, rhodium, palladium, iridium. None of these metals work for uh, this challenging reaction. As you can see here, <clears throat> uh, with this on-off experiment, it's not a radical chain reaction. And if you apply other chemical oxidants, in, including oxygen, uh, silver one salts, copper one, or manganese, uh, um, these are the corresponding yields, which compare unfavorable with the uh, electricity effect. If you want, if you're interested in the scope, uh, uh, you can enjoy uh, these uh, papers, which are on CO, CN, and more recently, CP form formation. I would rather like to discuss with you the mechanistic insights we gained from this uh, project. In addition, of course, that this reaction only worked with electricity. For example, if you take the nickel precursor and apply again uh, constant current, so potentiostatic react, uh, constant current, so galvanostatic reaction at eight milliampere, we can isolate this nickel three complex. And again, uh, we could, we could uh, isolate this complex. We can use it as a catalyst. So it's catalytically active. Also, if you want sort of a, yeah, not really crossover experiment, but with uh, different substitution uh, patterns. We have X-ray of this complex. So this is the X-ray structure of this nickel three complex. And then again, we have a strong indication that we have an oxidation induced reductive elimination so that we have a nickel three oxidation to nickel four. This is uh, shown here. So if, if you apply electricity, you get highly efficient reaction. You do not apply in a stoichiometric reaction. It uh, is very lousy. And the nickel four stabilization can be explained uh, when we did the DFT with, um, if you want a non-innocent uh, ligand type effect where electron density is also <clears throat> Uh, shared with the ligand system. Okay, these were uh, some um, earth abundant transition metals that we enjoyed to work with for CH activation. Another one was manganese. Um, and here I would, would like to make one point and that is that we can use this manganese saline type complexes for reactivities of substrates without any directing. If you want to paper with directing group, I refer you to this paper where we published on inner sphere reactivity. This is outer sphere reactivity. And as you can see here, the reaction occurs either in the benzylic position, but we can also make it work for cyclooctane. It's an electrochemical reaction. Uh, uh, here again with a carbon-based uh, anode uh, under carbonostatic reaction conditions. So it works for tertiary, but also for secondary non-activated um, CH. So no directing group for this manganese catalysis. That is, of course, then a very useful tool to do late stage diversification. So we can use this uh, manganese uh, catalysis, manganese 3, 4 catalysis to do diversification of these drug type uh, structures. Again, here, it's not a benzylic position. Um, so unactivated CH bonds. We're very much interested in how these catalysts actually work. And therefore we did again some cyclovoltammetry. <clears throat> well, actually Tiag first uh, synthesized these uh, complexes, as you can see here with the isolated yields. So we could make these manganese 4 bisazido complex. We studied their uh, electrochemical uh, behavior. And based on that, we proposed an outer sphere type 
or if you want metal hut type uh, acidation uh, manifold. Well, um, in the final second part that I would like to share with you is, is about arene modification where uh, we wanted to involve um, substrates that are not having any bidentate directly groups. And for that, we came to our old friend, which we developed a long time ago. I could give a separate talk on these ruthenium bis-carboxylate complexes and why they work and how they work. But what I would like to share with them, what they can do and what this uh, led uh, us to. So we studied um, the redox behavior of this ruthenium zero, ruthenium two couple. And as you can see here, we, we started the cyclovoltammetry of these where we could observe a significant influence of uh, the redox potential upon changing the concentration of an acid. That led us to a system where we now can do uh, CH activation with these ruthenium biscarboxylate complexes with weakly coordinating directly. Now, if you paid close attention in the first part of the talk, actually, uh, you may have seen that most of the substrates, if not all, uh, <clears throat> with the exception of the manganese, had a nitrogen containing directly group. So here we have a weakly coordinating oxygen, no specific electrolyte. Uh, the reaction works in aqueous media. You have an organometallic CH activation that works in water. And uh, the scope is rather broad. So you can make uh, uh, all of these compounds, for example, with sensitive uh, chlorides or ester or alkyl chlorides, if you wish to. These reactions work um, as uh, follows. So we have this ruthenium-2 complex, which does the organometallic CH activation. So we form this uh, ruthenium carbon bond, and this works in water. So it is fully tolerant of water, although it's an organometallic species. Alkyne insertion leads to the seven membered species, reductive emanation, reoxidation, and uh, we have proton reduction as the sacrificial process, which we can use for either paired electrolysis or for green hydrogen economy. Um, one recent example of this, so I, I should mention, we, uh, we did these studies with UI, who I think will be also in the next talk, very tangent postdoc, um, featured uh, also with rhodium, iridium, and osmium uh, catalysis, which uh, in the interest of time, I won't discuss uh, today. So that was recently published. What I would like to share with you is that we can um, utilize this, and it goes back to some important work of the chairman, and that we can combine this ruthenium chemistry uh, upon uh, choosing the suitable material for the electrodes with um, aryl iodide catalysis. So if you have this dual catalytic system, we can do oxygenations and what is not shown here, but this reaction also works without directing group for the ortho position. So with this, you can functionalize uh, uh, different arenes in the power position. And this works by a dual catalytic system in which you combine the ruthenium uh, manifold with the reoxidation chemistry of aryl iodide with hypervalent iodine. That's beautiful work from Nishiyama, but also the chairman and other people. But here we use it to, to uh, engage in a selective CO bond formation and combine it. So combine the in situ formation of hypervalent iodine relations with uh, transition metal catalysis. Um, yeah, that is uh, <coughs> the, the, the uh, the overpotential of the redox events is very important, and therefore also the nature of the anode is very important for this process. Okay, um, we did some more work on ruthenium, but I would rather like to shift gears to, to study, uh, to tell, share with you some rhodium chemistry uh, and some applications to what we could call material science. So this is a rhodium catalyzed refination, again, weakly coordinating directing group, which is not possible with the early systems that I showed you. And you can use this now again under aqueous conditions. You don't have any uh, electrolyte other than the acetate or supporting electrolyte to be precise. And uh, you can do this uh, for the synthesis of these uh, annulated system or you can do oxidative olefination reactions. But today I would like to share with you what this could bring about for uh, material science applications. 
So for example, you can combine this rhodium catalysis with an oxidation event um, <clears throat> to form these polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, these reactions proceed with high elements of regioselectivity, selectivity. And if you want to understand why that is, our suggestion is that it could be weak dispersive interactions, which are um, illustrated here with a uh, non-covalent uh, interaction plot in green color. This is again a reaction which, if you instead of taking green electricity, use copper two oxidants or silver oxidants, does not work efficiently. And that you can combine. So, in this case, here we have this uh, very interesting para iodo phenyl uh, boronic acid, which you can use for further uh, late stage modifications. Um, you can also use it, of course, for further annulation reactions. And you can take this uh, substrate and inspired by work, among others, by Gerhard Hild. We can use uh, DDQ as a catalyst to do an electrocatalytic Scholl reaction to make these uh, PAH compounds. And here's an X-ray crystal structure of the parent compound, which shows that it's nicely deviated from planarity. This is one example uh, how you can make interesting Polyaromatic systems. This is another one. It's actually a triple alkyne annulation here with these um, <clears throat> uh, now nitrogen containing uh, 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 directing groups. But this is actually desired because if you have those, you make actually kind of an azagraphene type structure. So we can further oxidize them if we want to. This rhodium, now it's rhodium catalysis. You tolerate an aryl iodide. You can tolerate a free alcohol, of course. In this case, it's the six OH groups. And I particularly like this reaction here. So we have an annulation with an alkyne, which tolerates sort of six azides. So no click chemistry or anything uh, interfering. But of course, you can use them afterwards to do click um, modification of the thus obtained products. Well, um, you can also understand how these reactions work. And just to give you a glimpse of an idea of, of how that works, uh, we isolated all of the key intermediates. So this is the uh, Rhoda cycle, the Metella cycle that is formed uh, selectively here. This is the uh, Metella cycle after the first uh, insertion of the alkynes so or the first annulation product. And so step by step by isolating the key intermediates, and this is an X-ray crystal structure of the product of these, Azer graphene type structures, we can show one by one uh, which bond is formed and what is the exact mechanism. For some um, application, it might be, as we've heard in the previous talk, beneficial to um, have these strategies available and operative in flow. And therefore, we develop this flow. Uh, Rhoda electrocatalysis, so rhodium uh, catalyzed electron catalysis, um, according to Anido Studer. For this, um, to put it into practice, we have a potentiostatic manifold in a commercially available system that was modified with a 3D printed turbulencer. And this allows for this annulation with these uh, hydroxy alkynes, so this probagenic alcohols, both in uh, this type of reaction with simple alkynes as well, but also in intramolecular fashion. But again, we are too excited about how things work, not only that they work and for what we can apply them. So this is um, some information how we proceeded here. So this is the metella cycle, the rhodium metella cycle in this case with the chloride, in this case with the acetate. Here we have, that is actually a very beautiful X-ray structure that Artonis got, uh, beautiful work where you have this seven-membered metella cycle uh, X-ray structure of, and again, by uh, stoichiometric experiments, we can uh, understand that it's probably an oxidation-induced reductive formation. We did uh, in operando enema uh, for an on-off experiment, uh, the reaction is strongly dependent on the, on the current, which indicates that this oxidation-induced reductive emanation is the rate-limiting step. And we did um, <clears throat> studies on the formation of this seven-membered metella cycle by inoperando uh, NMR, as well as CV studies, which overall result in a catalytic cycle. 
that um, I want to share with you again here the CV, but the key step is that we have an anodic oxidation of rhodium-3 to rhodium-4. So if we zoom in in this complex cycle, which I'm, um, which is beyond the scope of this, it's the anodic oxidation, it's the oxidation-induced reductive elimination. So that is the reoccurring event in addition uh, and the reoccurring mechanistic step um, <clears throat> that we identified here and uh, the, the really key early work on uh, such oxidation just reactive elimination goes back to Pierre Bornstein and Bill Jones arguably. Well, I, I shared with you different examples of selectivity, position selectivity. We can do DFT studies and by NCI plots understand and then the, the effects of dispersion on the regio selectivity. But our final dream was to do, uh, to combine electrochemical CH activation with enantial selectivity. And um, for these CH activation reactions, we first um, resorted to a transient directing group. This is third lysine, which forms this intermediate. So it's not a stoichiometric reaction, don't get me wrong, it's catalytic and palladium. But it's a reaction you can perform uh, electrochemically to make these atropo isomers. Interestingly, we could thereby introduce actually these transient directing groups for electrocatalytic. Uh, CH activation. And um, this is a kind of the scope and DEE. So you can see here that we can do in answer selective uh, electrocatalysis, uh, these CC um, atropo isomers, but we can also make NC atropo isomeric structures, DEEs, uh, in the, typically in the mid to high uh, 90s. And what I like about this reaction, so we use a transient directing group and we have as the key function group, we have an aldehyde. And as you know, aldehydes are oxidation sensitive and due to um, the uh, precise control of the um, dialing in the uh, potential, we can control that we don't have any over oxidation of the aldehyde, neither in the substrate nor in the product. What we can use this for is, uh, for instance, the synthesis of these helicines. So this is the typical pathway here. This is our product, which we can further transform function group interconversion. So um, uh, vitic olefination, perhaps um, metathesis or olefin metathesis gives this uh, enantiomer. Now, if we switch gears here, take this uh, substrate and do a, with it now with the D third lysine, not with L third lysine. The olefination we get access to this end uh, isomer, which delivers the end uh, uh, stereoisomer of the Sean product. And recently, we could extend this uh, for this NC axial chirality with uh, selectivity factors of up to 355 in electro uh, catalysis. And on off experiment shows that it's another radical chain reaction. And the same holds true. I should mention here, this is a recent contribution, which I'm not going to discuss today, but if you're interested in this one, very exciting uh, uh, contribution, which is actually not about atropo selectivity, um, and which is using a chiral rhodium complex. But in the interest of time, let me just share this uh, work from Joanna and uh, Shaojan, this recent work with you, in which uh, we can make these NC uh, atropoisomeric structures from, from these, uh, a chiral uh, analytes. Now, this uh, is not a transient directing group approach in contrast to what I've uh, just uh, shown you before, but I wanted to share this with you here today because uh, in, this, in this recent paper, so look it up, it just appeared on the, on the internet. In this work, where well, we have this analyte, we do uh, olefination or an allylation. If you have an allylic position, an allylation here. Um, we can use again uh, wind energy or solar energy. So that's, uh, I think, sort of a closing cycle. Now we can use renewable forms of energy directly without any plug with, um, to, to drive these reactions. Solar panel in the winter in Germany. Um, we get high EEs. We can use this for enhancer selective uh, CH activation. Here, Joanna showed that you can also have sort of consecutive kind of paired electrolysis or use um, uh, uh, modify the dust obtained product by a hydrogenation manifold. 
Okay. Um, with this being said, I, I hope I could show you that in the first part, we can use 3D transition metals. Yes, we can for electrochemical CH activation. I showed you one example in which we used um, biomass derived solvents for this purpose. I showed you a couple of examples in which we use renewable forms of energy, such as solar energy or wind energy. And uh, the reactions we've developed uh, can be uh, conducted in flow to improve uh, mass and heat transfer. I just told you that we can do para selective uh, CH activation. We can also do meta selective CH activation electrochemically. And in the last part, I showed you the lanzo selective transformation. I should maybe um, emphasize that we don't need directing groups. So I just briefly showed you we have examples for manganese catalysis, but also for ruthenium catalysis where directing group is not required. And thereby, I hope um, in the inverse color order, if you want, uh, we contribute to green and sustainable uh, chemistry development. Um, and as additional, so I tried to highlight the number of reactions where electricity uh, is needed to achieve the reaction. So it's not possible to chemical oxidants. You can dial in the required potential, which gives you chemoselectivity, achieved uh, or gained significant new mechanistic insights and novel reactivity and selectivity. Um, before thanking my coworkers, I would also, just like before, try to use this occasion to show you that we are also planning a very exciting in-person meeting this summer in Göttingen. So the International Symposium on CH activation is scheduled for June. So if you're excited, want to learn more, but not from me, from other people in the field about CH activation, please come and visit us in Göttingen. 19 to 22nd of June. And since this is also available on YouTube, you can use this uh, QR code to register. With this being said, the most important slide, of course, at the end, no uh, uh, advertisement here. So I'm very grateful to my coworkers for all their dedicated uh, contributions without which um, nothing would have been possible. You've seen the names there, and this is a, an earlier picture a couple of years ago. Um, we're very, I'm very grateful to them as well as to our collaboration partners and these funding agencies, um, particularly at the moment, the ITN uh, chair, so CH Activation for Industrial Renewal, ERC, and the DFG, as well as industrial collaboration partners. And today I'm very thankful for you and um, your attendance and your listening and uh, your attention. And I would be happy to take any questions. Yeah, so thank you, thank you very much for this very impressive talk, um, and uh, and also for advocating electrosynthesis. And hopefully, uh, some people are now convinced to try electrochemistry for their own applications. Um, so um, yeah, the, the talk is now open for a discussion. Uh, maybe I don't see a question. Maybe I start briefly. Uh, so um, I was a little bit interested in into the reaction rate uh, because the the currents you have shown were typically between three and eight milliamps. So what is the limitation? Is it the diffusion of the catalyst or is it the rate of the catalytic reaction? And what can we do to enhance the, the current if for upscaling, for instance? <clears throat> so in most of the cases, I guess uh, the reoxidation or the oxidation to induce the reductive emanation would be, as far as we can see, the rate limiting. Uh, there are some examples, for example, in, in um, some of the recent asymmetric um, palladium catalyzed reactions, it would be the CH activation. So there we observe a kinetic isotope effect. But in the others, it's typical the redox event. So, and arguably the oxidation induced reductive emission, although to understand this kinetically and not thermodynamically is not necessarily easy. Uh, what we can do would be. Um, uh, cell design. So we tried it with the um, with the um, flow system, for example, in different architectures there could help. Another thing we suggested and that I am still a strong advocate, although we, we still are in the process is immobilized catalyst, uh, as we've seen for, for small molecule activation. But there's nothing that I would be able to share with you today already. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. In the meantime, one, uh, one question popped up from the audience. Um, so uh, when metal salts were used, uh, were nanoparticles or metal deposits uh, observed, perhaps on the porous uh, carbon electrodes? Yeah, that's a very important point. Uh, this mm -hmm. is actually what we try to prevent, particularly at the uh, uh, cathode, if you have an undivided cell. So all but the first uh, cobalt paper were in undivided cell, um, other than the palladium. So the palladium is an issue because that likes to agglom agglomerate in the palladium zero state. And for that, it can be beneficial to have as a ligand slash redox mediator benzoprenone derivatives um, to stabilize the palladium zero and particularly to prevent the nanoparticle formation because these would not be active and particularly not uh, selective in, in asymmetric transformations. Uh, it's a very important question. Mm. Shobik, yeah. yeah. questions. Hey, very inspiring chemistry. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Very inspiring chemistry. So I have uh, one question. Uh, so, of course, the chemistry is very beautiful. I was I was just thinking whether would it would it be possible to do some sp three CH bond functionalization yeah. without using any directing group and by electrocatalysis? Do you yeah, think, yeah, yeah. Do you think a... that's possible? Of course, it's very challenging. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a very important point. So I, I, in the interest of time, I just shared with you this one small example. And but uh, thank you for um, allowing me to maybe quickly jump there again. Uh, jump is too much. Uh, but I saw but we use the manganese catalyst. So this is I saw a couple of examples. Yes. Yeah, exactly. but, uh, so. Let's say if we go a bit further for saying steroids, <laughs> you, you, you know, my, you know, my intention. So when the, yeah, so for example, here you have estrone acetate, uh, which you can do, which is maybe somewhat activated in this benzoic position. Mm -hmm. Particularly like the, so here we have menthol, which has no directing group or no benzoic position, or cyclooctane. Yield is still uh, not as high as the others, but it's a secondary unactivated um, sp3 CH1. So it's a simple alkane. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a very important point, so thank you. Uh, Shubik, uh, with which we are having uh, a lot of uh, fun at the moment. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> thank you, Lutz. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much for this great chemistry. Right, Adam, do, do you want to? Ah, okay. My voice is a bit down. Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe, maybe uh, I have more. I'm more uh, have a general interest uh, because the, the reactions, the, these beautiful reactions you show, uh, are quite complex. Uh, you have a complex interplay between uh, electrode processes. You have the, a complicated catalytic cycle um, and uh, numerous parameters on top of the regular parameters like uh, temperature or solvent. You have the current density electrode material and so forth. And I wonder um, how you develop such a process? What is your strategy? Do you start with a certain target molecule and adapt the catalyst? Or do you have a catalyst and, and screen for, for the options, what you can make? So, so it's, maybe you can share your, your way how you get to the goal in these cases. Yeah, it's, it's probably both. And mm -hmm. along the way, we, we learn more and more. We also uh, try to use uh, more correlation and potentially AI to do that. But um, yeah, we um, <clears throat> uh, we gained uh, twenty decade, uh, two decades <laughs> of experience in CH activation. I think that helps also for for this for this part. But yeah, I mean, um, in contrast to the beautiful work on electrosynthesis, let's say uh, here we have let's say five or six additional steps disregarding all the substrate coordination, decoordination, and that can make it sometimes a bit more complicated. So doing kinetics and identifying which is the right kind of step is certainly also helpful. And then we try in all of these systems that I've shown you today, I think we managed to isolate the intermediates and to study their redox chemistry and learn more about, for example, this beautiful uh, cobalt 3-4 uh, system or this nickel 3-4 system, I think is. Uh, it's fun to, to observe based on this one. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, well, if, if there's no further question also for the interest, of, in the interest of time, we are a little bit behind schedule, I would say 
uh, we move forward. Uh, thank you, Lutz. Thank you again uh, very much for this uh, very nice talk. Um, we will now proceed uh, with our third speaker, so uh, uh, Jan Erling Beckwald from Stockholm University. While he warms up, uh, I'm going to uh, to comment or say a few things on his uh, CV and uh, introduce his background. So it's my great pleasure, yeah, to to introduce you. Uh, for, so so uh, Jan Erling Beckwald is from the Department of Organic Chemistry at Stockholm University. Um, but he received his PhD from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm uh, before he moved uh, to the United States to carry out postdoctoral studies in the group of Barry Sharpless uh, at MIT. Then he returned to Stockholm uh, to start his independent career at the same place at the Royal Institute of Technology as a faculty member. This was followed by an appointment as a professor in organic chemistry at Uppsala, or maybe Uppsala, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, in Sweden. Afterwards, he moved back uh, to the Swedish capital to become full professor, but at Stockholm University, where he is now still active with his group. So aside from his research, uh, Jan is currently very busy with coordinating uh, the Wallenberg Initiative. This is a grant uh, of approximately uh, 200 million euros uh, that has been invested or is going to be invested by the Wallenberg Founda uh, Foundation to propel uh, material science and sustainable chemistry in Sweden. And this is a huge responsibility, my respect. <laughs> And um, uh, so, so again, so um, Jan is very active and world famous uh, for his achievements in the field of organometallic transformations, uh, biomimetic oxidations, dynamic kinetic resolutions, and uh, enzyme catalysis. And his research has been rewarded and, and recognized uh, with numerous prizes, uh, such as the Arrhenius Medal, uh, which was given by the Swedish Chemical Society in 1986 the Celsius Medal in Gold by the Royal Society of Sciences in Uppsala, Uppsala in 2002 and the ERC Advanced Grant and many more prizes and, and lectureships, which I'm not able to mention now uh, in the interest of time. And instead, uh, I would like to hand over to you now, Jan. Uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Please, um, yeah, the screen is yours. <clears throat> uh. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. <clears throat> and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, <clears throat> very exciting event. And uh, <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Yeah, okay. We, thank you can you. also see your slides, yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> That's great. All right, so I will talk about the biomimetic catalysis in green organic transformations today. <clears throat> And this is the structure of my lecture. Uh, first, I will start with palladium catalyzed oxidative carbon cyclizations and cascades, and then go over to talk about biomimetic oxidation that uh, uses air as oxidant, and, um, heter and then heterogeneous nanometal catalysts, and then a little bit. In the end, unfortunately, I can only show a few overview slides on dynamic kinetic resolution and hybrid catalysts. Uh, in the interest of time. Now, catalytic green transformations, nature's way of carrying out these transformations uh, in, that we have in nature are very mild reactions and there are no harmful side products and often, uh, often they are very highly uh, stereoselective. Now, we have worked with biomimetic catalysis in two areas shown here. Oxidations via low energy electron transfer, and often these are carried out under aerobic conditions, as shown here. <clears> they <throat> have used these kind of electron transfer cascades. And then we have other cascade reactions, both with metals and involving enzymes. And the combination of enzymes and metal catalysis, the so called dynamic kinetic resolution. And uh, in these reactions, we are using both. Uh, um, homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis as well as enzyme catalysis. And we see here the different catalysts. Here, here is a, actually a, <clears throat> an electron microscopy of nanon particles. So uh, now CC bond formations under oxidative conditions, that's a challenging um, 
reaction because uh, when you make CC bonds, you usually have a cationic carbon and that is very susceptible of being oxidized. Uh, so we have to use special techniques there. And I will talk about palladium catalyzed oxidative carbon cyclizations. Now in these reactions, you have uh, two carbons that are uh, joined to each other by uh, loss of hydrogen. And then in this process, uh, exemplified here by palladium. Uh, palladium two is going to palladium zero and then you reoxidize. So this is an example uh, as Lutz Ackermann told about very mild, you have no leaving groups, just hydrogens are removed from the reaction. Now, if you go further with that, <clears throat> you can actually use electron transfer mediators here. So you trans, I mean, quinone is, is used then in catalytic amounts. And then another electron transfer mediator is you transfer the electrons to molecular oxygen. And I will talk, I will show some <clears throat> examples of that later on. So these biomimetic carbon cyclizations uh, are, <clears throat> are quite um, uh, green reactions. Now, uh, in the carbon cyclization, we have focused a lot on, on alenes. And alenes are uh, interesting because they are nucleophilic in the middle carbon. So if you coordinate this compound to palladium, palladium will be attacked in an in type reaction by the middle carbon. I should mention that this CH bond is actually interacting with the palladium. So it's a, it's a truly CH activation, but I've written it in a simplified way here. And then in this attack, you get the dienyl palladium, which undergoes an olefin insertion, and then a beta elimination. And in the beta elimination, you finally form palladium zero from the hydrido palladium. And that is reoxidized by benzoquinone. Uh, an example of this is shown here. It's a cascade reaction. So we use uh, this enaline material and we get generate this cyclized, uh, <clears throat> this pyroline product, uh, if you have a nitrogen as X here. But in this case, we are not actually isolating this, but we are using malamid in the reaction, everything is mixed in a reaction and there is malamid trapping this, con this uh, pyrroline continuously to give you this uh, tricyclic compound. So you see from a very simple linear compound, you get the complicated tricyclic compounds in one reaction. Now, um, so this is the reaction I had on the slide before. We have an olefin insertion and beta elimination. Now, the uh, question is, can you trap this by uh, some, uh, let's say, diboron compounds or aryl boronic acids? Then you would get these type of compounds. And yes, you can. And we have, this is already published. I will not dwell more on that, but just show you that we have everything mixed in the reaction mixture. We have the diboron added from the beginning and also here the phenylboronic acid. So it's an interesting cascade reaction. Now here <clears throat> are shown a little bit what we have done recently on aline carbon cyclizations. Uh, this I showed you, and this is the trapping so uh, reaction where we trap with different radians. And then we can use, I don't have time to talk so much about that, uh, uh, alanines. And, and there you have an extra double bond here compared to the first. And then, of course, here you will get an extra double bond. So that is a more or less the same reaction. The lower reaction is interesting because there the the propagylic hydrogen actually participated to make an aline and then that reacted with the aline. We can also make CH activations, <clears throat> make these type of compounds with the aline there. And then these alines give you access to a six member ring. With the others, it's mainly five member rings that are favored, but with these alines, we get six member ring also. But we have other ways now, I will show you later, to get six member rings. <clears throat> Now, um, in these reactions, palladium is coordinating to this aline carbon and, and the hydrogen is interacting with palladium and you get this in attack. And in the end, you trap it with, with let's say, a phenyl group here. Now, if you make this one carbon shorter now, you will 
get this uh, dienyl palladium, but the cyclization now is quite unfavored, an extra cyclization to four member ring. So there you can trap uh, the vinyl palladium with the phenyl boronic acid in a Suzuki type coupling. So you can get this compound. So we made uh, those type of, of couplings, it's shown here. We have these alines <clears throat> with an R group here, phenyl boronic acids, and you get these compounds. Now, the most important thing with this paper is not that you can make this, it's more the, the important take home message is what we found when we have different R groups. Look here, if you have the R group and allyl here, so this is the case here, you have the allyl group there, you have R is an allyl, you get an 83% yield of three, this compound. But if you saturate this double bond, that's a double bond is saturated. Look at what you get. No product at all. You just get recovered starting material. The same with, meth with the methyl group. So this was an eye opener for us. We had, we had thought that the aline showed this reactivity, but you really need the coordination of the double bond to get the reaction here. So that was the important thing. And we took advantage of that as shown here, we use this olefin now as a helping olefin to activate the aline. And once it has activated, you can have an olefin exchange and get an olefin further away. And now you can make the six member ring. I told you that it was not easy to do that before, but now we have this trick with the helping olefin. So now we can access six member rings. And uh, without this helping olefin, see here, there is no reaction whatsoever. So you cannot cyclize these compounds. So here we have now extended this reaction so that it works well with this to give six member rings. And we have, this is a selected example so of some reactions that we run. Now, uh, an, another question came up that can we use other uh, activating groups instead of the olefin? What about ketones? And what about alcohols? Yes, they work uh, good and, and you, you have this activation with the oxygen here and with the ligand exchange, you get uh, cyclization out to the six member ring and you get these products. And, and as before, there are slightly different reaction conditions, but under these reaction conditions also, you have essentially nothing of, of the cyclization if you don't have this oxo, uh, or ketone or alcohol here. So the ketones works uh, yields up to 70%. The alcohols were, were even more interesting because there not only did you get a nice reaction to get six member rings, but also you got the high diastereoselectivity, only the trans compound was formed. And this is, you see here, it's 50 to one in all cases here, and the yields are quite good in this reaction. So that was uh, the more uh, synthetically useful reaction of this paper. Now, stereochemistry and chirality, then Louis Pasteur uh, discovered this in 1848 when he separated these tartaric acid molecules, the salts. Now enantiomers are mirror images of each other and they have different uh, properties when it comes, let's say, to biological activity like smell, uh, the S-limonene and R-limonene, uh, the different ones uh, smells, this is the lemon smell and this is the uh, the other fruit, grapefruit uh, from the olimonin. And now uh, pharmaceuticals are often sold these as an antium because of this, because in the body they can have different uh, activity. Now, uh, can we make an asymmetric version of this borrelated carbon cyclization? This is the reaction I showed you where we, we form this dienyl, we in, insert here and we, we trap with the boron compound reductive elimination to give this. Now, um, first we thought about using a chiral anion. Also, we thought about using benzoquinone, chiral benzoquinone. Now, that is more difficult. We had, prob had problems with that in the past in our 1,4 oxidations. 
So, and also you can use a chiral ligand and palladium, but we, we choose actually to use a chiral anion here. And um, the anion, uh, well, I should mention that there are really limited examples on enantioselective palladium 2 catalyzed oxidation, in particular with CC bond formation. So that it's a challenge to, to make this enantioselective. Now the chiral lig uh, counter ion, we could get was by using this chylorophosphoric acid because these are very, really strong acids. They are nine pKa units stronger than acetic acid in, in the MSO, in an organic solvent. So it means if you have palladium acetate and give this strong acid, you protonate off the acetate on palladium and, and the anion of this will take acetate's place. Now, in preliminary experiment, we did, we used palladium acetate and added the phosphoric acid. And uh, well, we didn't get so good, it was 28% DE. We were happy anyway that there was something because it could have been zero also if you were unlucky. So we, we continued there and working uh, and trying not to change the acids. And now just to make a long story short, we finally went to this 2, two prime biphenyl type phosphoric acid and they really brought us up in up above 90% DE in this carbocyclization. So this was a really good um, experience for us because we had, we had really put a lot of effort in making an anti-selective palladium catalyzed oxidation. And so finally, finally we achieved it and the champagne was coming out here. So uh, another cascade reaction is shown here. We have two uh, carbon monoxide and, and uh, co components uh, and carbon monoxide and an acetylene that can participate here. You see, we make four new carbon-carbon bonds in this reaction. And the mechanism is shown here. <clears throat> the activation is like it was shown before. And then you have a carbonylation and an olefin insertion, and then another carbonylation. And you come to this uh, um, acid palladium that is coupling with the acetylene. Now, uh, it, there is apparently a high, uh, kinetic selectivity here because you don't have coupling with the acetylenes in these instances. The carbonylation is faster and it's only when you come to the end that you get this acetylene coupling. So <clears throat> we have uh, we had nine examples in, in the paper that I reported and, I, and we have used, later we used this reaction for uh, in an enantioselective way. And we tried now, of course, we tried first the, the uh, phosphoric acid that we had tried before, uh, and those gave really poor EE. It was very low, and we had to go to this vapor type where you have this bent aromatic system. And here we had finally success with this system, and we could come up to an ER of 95 to 5, which was the, 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 the quite acceptable. We needed chlorobenzene to do that. Um, that to get this enantioselectivity. Now, uh, we wanted to extend this, you remember this direct relation of the allene that we had in the beginning of my talk. We wanted to extend that to borylation. So we did that. <clears throat> so we replaced the phenyl boron acid with B2P2 and we get this uh, borylation. It works fine. Uh, it goes via this mechanism uh, and where you have this intermediate and it couples. And we could have stopped here and published a small paper about the extension of this reaction to boron. But my coworker UIQ did not do that. He, he started to play around with change solvent. And look here, look here what he got. The cyclobutene was formed. This was a real surprise for us. We had thought that cyclobutene could not be formed. That was the argument before. And suddenly, by changing to, to acetone, it got the 36% of the cyclobutene. And look here, changing to methanol and have a small amount of triethylamine, cyclobutene is the sole product. 
when there is nothing of the other coupling. So that was a really a surprise for us. And we, we could, in this way, get a highly divergent reaction. If you, if you work in methanol with triethylamine, you got this cyclobutene. If you work in n acetic acid, you get the coupling. And we run that in gram scale also to show the usefulness of the reaction. So, so I think the most important part of this paper was that we could make a number of cyclobutene compounds uh, by, by now modifying the reaction conditions. And uh, <clears throat> we went on using this cyclobutene information and having a pending olefin. Uh, and and in, in that case, uh, you see, we form, you form this intermediate, you cyclize, and then depending olefin interacts with palladium and after inser olefin insertion, you get this spirocyclic intermediate that, uh, that inserts CO and, and then um, you get this acyl palladium that is trapped by the acetylene. Now, this gives us spirocyclobutenes, and these compounds are really difficult to prepare with other methods. And I should mention that the starting material is very easy to make. We make the aline by having a propadulic acetate here. So this is uh, uh, an acetylene here, and, and, and here we have the acetate. And, and usually, typically, in the Grignard, copper catalyzed Grignard reaction or iron catalyzed Grignard reaction, make this, these compounds. So, from simple starting material, we can make this now complicated spirocyclobutenes. And here are some selected examples uh, from that paper where we prepare these um, uh, spirocyclobutenes, which should have. Yeah, quite some interest in, in organic uh, chemistry. Now uh, I come to the aerobic oxidations. And uh, in, in the respiratory chain, we have a stepwise electron transfer in this system where NADH is oxidized to NAD+. And a typical example here is if you have alcohol dehydrogenase, NAD+, plus is is oxidizing the alcohol with the help of this enzyme. And the NADH is now going into this respiratory chain and it comes um, it, to the quinone, the, the coenzyme Q, the ubiquinone, where it's oxidized. And the hydroquinone continues up to be, being oxidized with an, this porphyry, iron porphyry in acetochrome C. And, and then in the end, uh, together with oxygen then, so the oxygen will uh, actually oxidize uh, uh, the whole, uh, the, the NADH by, by this electron transfer. So, so here we demonstrated in principle this kind of electron transfer because this is, we have a quinone here like the ubiquinone and this is a metal macrocycle also iron but it's, it's an iron pour, um, uh, you see you have nitrogens here, so it's, it's quite stable, iron phthalocyanin. Uh, so we have in this case, in the, when we have this electron trans, we get low barriers in each, uh, in, in each cycle here. So we, we transfer electrons very mild. Now we use this for another carbocyclization where we have this enalanine. Uh, and we, in this case, you see, we put together the quinone uh, and, and the metal microcycle in one hybrid molecule. So we have a hybrid ele electron transfer mediator now. So, in, so here we use this helping olefin to, to access the acetylene and after alkyne insertion and trapping with phenylbronic acid, we get to these compounds. Now, uh, the, the strength with this, um, uh, let's say, hybrid catalyst where we join the two, two ATMs together is that the in, intramolecular electron transfer 
leads to a faster reaction and it's shown here. Here is this uh, hybrid catalyst where we, we have the hydroquinone and cobalt cellophane in the same molecule. And here they are separate. We have actually either DQ or, or, or hydroquinone. You see it's, it's a dramatic uh, rate enhancement here of, of, of the reaction where you, where you use this hybrid catalyst. And in this way, we can prepare a range of uh, uh, compounds as shown here. Uh, and it, it works really well with this uh, combined uh, uh, electron transfer mediator. And I, I, should like, I would like to emphasize here that this is a really green reaction because you use molecular oxygen. So there are no side products from, from the oxidant at all. Uh, then we looked into preparing cis 14 di substituted heterocycles. Uh, they are occur in many natural products and they are quite challenging to make. And the approach here was that we use this aline approach uh, with, with a directing group that activates the aline. And um, in, in this activation, you get this vinyl metal compound. And, and uh, in of the ligand exchange, you, you will coordinate now the free olefin, the pending olefin here, either in the re-phase manner as shown here, or in a C-phase manner as shown below. And uh, if you look on this, uh, it, it will be a, more like a chair seven member ring if you consider this carbon being bound also. And not only by just considering the conformation, but also from DFT calculation, we could conclude that this uh, uh, intermediate was more stable. And uh, that cyclizes then, and from that cyclization with the recoordination, you will get the R group and the met this uh, carbon metal on the same phase, on the same side of the ring. So you get the cis compound. So this was a kind of prediction you can make from, from uh, from the models uh, looking into the intermediates. And indeed, this is what happens also. You get, <coughs> we use this um, boron compound. Uh, we, this is related to B-pin, but it's slightly different and it worked better here called B-neo. And uh, <coughs> in this case, we got uh, an 18 to one uh, cis trans and, and a good yield. And, and we have this intramolecular transfer in, in, the, in the ETM here, electron transfer mediator. And we just demonstrated that if you take that uh, directing olefin in a way by saturating here, you get no reaction at all. You can recover the, completely recover the starting material. And uh, <clears throat> with this uh, method, we could prepare a large number of cis 14 di substituted compound. We even made a, 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 a nitro 14 di substituted heterocycle. So that reaction works really good. Now uh, I, I will show some other examples of biomimetic aerobic oxidations. And this is an oxidation of alcohols. And we went now to iron because as we saw iron is, is extremely cheap and it's also environmentally friendly. So <clears throat> we had worked previously with, with the, the Schwab catalyst and this is related to the Schwab catalyst. Uh, and in order to make this reactive, you need to, to react it with an amine oxide as shown here. So you kick out one CO with that, you oxidize one CO to CO2. And now you have an active catalyst that can make a dehydrogenation of the alcohol. So the proton goes to the OH here and <clears throat> the CH goes to the iron. And that uh, species, now the iron hydride, is, can react with benzoquinone to give the hydroquinone and, and give back the active dehydrogenation catalyst. And then we use uh, <clears throat> cobalt cellophane type ligand here uh, to help the aerobic oxidation uh, of the hydroquinone. So, so that works 
uh, quite well and we can oxidize a large number of alcohols. Uh, even we had a few examples of aldehyde in this paper. Uh, more recently, uh, well, I should mention that this mimics the respiratory chain uh, because you can see this as, this can be seen as an a NADH H plus where the H plus is here and the NADH is, is this hydride. And then we have like the ubiquinone and we have <clears throat> compared this to cytochrome C. Now we extended that recently to, to also oxidation of amines. And in this case, it was absolutely necessary to have this hybrid catalyst. If you use the separate ETMs, the yield was below 20% or even less in many cases. So it was hard to get the uh, reaction working, but with this, combined DTM, we got really good yields, good to high yields uh, of, of these oxidized amines to imines. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the PMP is paramethoxyphenyl. And uh, it's interesting now to, to look into the mechanism of this hydrogen transfer or this electron transfer, I'm sorry, in, in these uh, reactions. The amine is oxidized to imine and uh, this 16 electron complex is taking up uh, a proton and a hydride. And uh, <clears throat> now the oxidized form of this uh, hybrid catalyst, hybrid ETM, uh, this quinone, this hydride, half of this molecule will take up these two hydrogens and form this molecule. And that is now reacting with molecular oxygen to give this. Uh, oxo, uh, per, per oxo uh, complex and <clears throat> then uh, this is now uh, actually oxidizing one of the hydroquinones here and, and you lose water and then you will have a cobalt oxo that can oxidize the other quinone. So uh, this is a suggested mechanism for this hybrid catalyst. Now to non-opalating catalysis, <clears throat> we, we have used um, um, mesocellular foam with a pore size of 26 nanometers. And this is foams, these are spherical cavities that are connected to each other. So we have a sphere here and a sphere here and here, and they are connected to each other with, uh, uh, um, on each side with, entrances or connections between each other so you, molecules can go in between these and now this since this is a silica material we use this standard method three three aminopropyl trimethoxysilane to put in to bind to the silica wall to the hydroxy group to the silica and then you will create amino groups as handles for the transition metals and in this case palladium so adding palladium two binds palladium 2 very, very strongly to this amine, to this amino group. And then we reduce it and we get nanoparticles uh, that are presumably bound to one or several amino groups in, in this uh, nanocatalyst. So this nanocatalyst, uh, we have used it a lot for hydrogenations and other reactions, but we can also use it in our carbocyclization more recently. But I should show you here the, <clears throat> the, the electron microscopy picture. You can see a lot of dots here. These are, because this is a scale bar, 10 nanometers here. So the dots are between one and two nanometers. We made a more careful analysis, of course. But look here. These are the, you can see the shape of the cavities actually. This was a bonus of this uh, TEM. So these are about 25, 26 nanometers, these uh, cavities. So uh, this is what we did. We put this aminopropyl group on that. This should be a little bit bent because it's spherical. And uh, you get palladium two bound and you reduce it. So that's what I had on the slide before. Now you, you get, you, we created, uh, uh, more recently, uh, efficient catalyst or from these for carbocyclizations. So we, we prepared um, <clears throat> these bicyclic lactones, uh, 
Uh, and, and interesting, you can recycle this nine times with no change in yield, and PD leaching is less than 0 0.1 ppm. And we remember from, from Lutz Ackermann's talk that you, you actually tolerate a lot more than that. So this is really, really low, and, and it's acceptable in most cases. And you can also prepare <coughs> the lactams, and these lactons and lactams are important in pharmaceutical industry. Now, in this uh, <coughs> uh, reaction, we found an interesting chemodivergent reaction in, in the sense that if you use this uh, non-catalyst, uh, you get this bicyclic lactone. But if you use, uh, or lactam even, uh, if you use homogeneous catalysis, you get only um, this, uh, you don't get the bicyclic lactone, you just get this lactone. <clears throat> so why is the reaction taking two directions here? Well, um, this is actually the cavity now uh, that is about 26 nanometers uh, of, of the mesocellular foam. So in the, all these particles <clears throat> are actually consisting of both palladium two and palladium zero. And that's important because we know that carbon monoxide binds really good to palladium zero. And that makes this a much better carbonylation catalyst. And we can see this by XPS, by the way. So uh, we can say that palladium two promotes carbon cyclization, palladium zero promotes CO insertion. So in the heterogeneous catalyst, after getting this dienyl palladium, which is actually shown here also, the dienyl palladium is immediately carbonylated with the heterogeneous palladium because there is a lot of CO and it's very active. And then there is an olefin insertion and a CO insertion. So this first this insertion, this CO insertion, and then <clears throat> you cyclize. In the homogeneous phase, we believe that the CO insertion is very slow here. And in the meantime, this uh, amine or this alcohol attacks the coordinated CO. And uh, this would give this intermediate that after reductive elimination gives the, the, uh, more, the, <clears throat> the simple lactone. So to conclude here, the heterogeneous uh, catalyst you direct CO insertion into the vinyl very fast, and, and, and with the homogeneous, this vinyl this carbonylation is very slow. So attacked by, by this uh, X group uh, competes. Now, <clears throat> uh, we went on to do some reactions where we activate with amino groups. So, so the idea was to have formation with this dienyl palladium. And the question, can we make a CO insertion now to make pyrrolidone? And here we actually use nanocellulose as carrier for palladium. And uh, <clears throat> this is crystalline nanocellulose. And uh, we have this aminopropyl group. They are now attached uh, to the hydroxy group of the cellulose. And we, when we run this reaction <clears throat> with this um, palladium on, on this nanocellulose, uh, we didn't get any product at all. You see, zero percent yield. However, if we added one mole percent of silver triflate, we got a very high yield. So there was a dramatic effect by by addition of silver. And, and what is happening here? Well, we analyzed the ratio chloride to palladium and found that uh, for, be, before addition of silver is about two and after addition there is essentially zero. The XPS shifted a little bit. Uh, the, so what is happening, we believe that <clears throat> silver strips off the chloride to get the catalytic active cationic complex, which is the, the real catalyst. So with that um, silver trick, uh, adding a silver triggered reaction here, uh, we had in a small amount, we got good yields of, of these um, <clears throat> um, pyrrolidones and, um, and we are using our crystalline nanocellulose 
as uh, um, actually our, our support for this reaction. Uh, the reaction can be recycled. You see here nine times. The ninth time uh, we have still a yield above 90%. And the DXPS before uh, actually the first of the the first run and after the ninth run, they are almost identical. They overlap completely here. And also the TEM, <coughs> the electron microscopy picture, the TEM after the first run is shown here, and after the ninth run is shown here. They are you cannot see a difference here in particle size. It's about one to two nanometers. Now, finally, uh, I would like to just show you some pictures uh, of um, some slides. Since we are working, we have been working with um, dynamic kinetic resolution. And the principle here is that you, you create a resumization between the, the it exits either oxygen or nitrogen with alcohol or an amine. And that goes <clears throat> through via the ketone or the imine back and forth. And only one of the enantiomers react with the enzyme. And uh, as shown is the one above. Uh, so you can in principle get 100% yield uh, with, this, with this principle. Often a lipase is used and the meta source can be homogeneous and het or heterogeneous. And, and in this way, you can uh, prepare a large number of alcohols and amines in an antimeric pure form. And, and I will show you some example of where we have used a, a nano palladium actually in these reactions. And, and one example is shown here. So in these cavities, uh, we bind in not only palladium as we have done, but we also bind in the enzyme and uh, when the amine comes in, of course, it can be both racemized and resolved. So we, are, we have an acyl donor also coming in here. And now comes uh, the enantiomeric pure amine in 99% yield and 99% DE. So that is a very efficient, uh, heterogeneous um, uh, high, uh, DKR with a hybrid, ca hybrid catalyst efficient deracemization and, and and more recently we have used now microcrystalline cellulose as an artificial plant cell wall for DKR and uh, in this microcrystalline cellulose I should mention also that microcrystalline cellulose is really really cheap <clears throat> inexpensive it, it's Avicel 11 uh, it, it, it's it's uh, it's cost about two to three dollars per kilogram if you buy 20 kilograms so here we have the enzyme and the nanometals integrated in, in this microcrystalline cellulose and <clears throat> so we have a racemization going on and we have a resolution going on so outcomes also here the enantiomeric pure amines and you see we have quite good yields from this um, <clears throat> um, DKR system immobilized on microcrystalline cellulose. To conclude then, um, I've I hope I've shown you that we can make a lot of useful carbocyclization cascade reactions of different alenes. And we had enantioselective versions also that we developed and we had aerobic biomimetic oxidations both of uh, aline substrates and of alcohols and amines. <clears throat> and then in the end, I, I talked a little bit about heterogeneous nanopalladium. I think this is an area that will be very important because uh, most people working with palladium know the problem of recycling palladium acetate, but here you can mimic, you can actually mimic palladium acetate in many of the reactions because they, they work equally well but you can recycle yeah, as we've shown up to nine times without any problems. And uh, here are the people who were involved over the years in our project. And here is where we uh, have received support. And uh, here's a group picture that we took in our, in our garden this summer 
uh, and several of the people have left. Now, this is Wei Jun Kong. He actually came from Ackerman and he left uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, so finally, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me, in particular, Adam Slaboon, who actually made, made the personal invitation to me. And I would like to thank the European Chemical Society for supporting this uh, these events and and finally thank you for your thank you for that for your attention for your kind attention also yeah thank you very much uh, for this very inspiring and, and beautiful talk um so I, i'm sure that there are a lot of questions um i think we should do it systematically and maybe first uh, move to the to the last topic yeah the, the palladium nano catalysts um, and um, there is a question uh, in the chat from Adam, uh, because he cannot still, <laughs> still raise his voice. Um, so his question is, if you would change to support from cellulose to something else, uh, perhaps mesoporous silica, would you still achieve such a low palladium leaching? Uh, yes, I mean, we have, um, we have done the leaching test with the mesoporous silica as well, and it's, it's equally low there. So cellulose is not unique when it comes to leaching, but it's interesting because you, you don't have these cavities in cellulose in, as you have in uh, mesocellular foam, but still the cellulose uh, works really well when it comes to leaching. Okay, thank you. So, uh, but, but I should mention I that- I've if, seen, ah, okay. Yeah, uh, if you take, if, if you take normal silica, like you use for flash chromatography, and not the mesoporous silica, then you have problems with leaching. We tested that once and we could not recycle as many times with simple silica. Okay, I, I also have a direct question. Uh, uh, so Shobik and Lutz, please wait a second. I have a direct question regarding this topic. Uh, I was wondering uh, whether the uh, for the palladium catalyst, the nano catalyst, um, uh, you have um, determined or, or dealt with the internal efficiency, the, the degree of pore utilization. In other words, are you sure that direction proceeds within the pores or outside of the catalyst? Yes, uh, I, in in most in the cases I've shown you, uh, we are quite certain that it it, it uh, occurs occurs in the pores and palladium is not leaching out. But we had one case where we had palladium on on uh, charcoal where actually we had the boomerang effect. So the, the metal went out, but after the reaction, it went back. So we could filter it off still. So it, but there, there could be these examples also, like you have a boomerang effect, but I don't think in these uh, cases I showed you now, uh, we have no sign of that we have metal coming out and do the reaction. Well, I was referring more whether the reaction takes place at the outer sphere so uh, at your particles yeah so so is, is direction fast with respect to mass transfer inside the pores so, so oh, or okay. is the reaction rather slow and so that the substrate has time to diffuse into the pores uh, we have demonstrated um, the pore effect once if you remember this cartoon i had uh, where we had the enzyme and the palladium in this color for mesocellular foam, mm. the, the spherical. Uh, there, we, we made an, an experiment. We, we made pores with only palladium, and then we made pores with only enzyme. Then we get two powders. They are slightly different in color, but two powders. And then we mix the powders and run. The reaction went about ah. seven to eight times slower than mm. if, when we made it in the same pore. So we, we are right. quite sure that it occurs in the pores at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So, uh, well, Lutz, uh, please. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, beautiful talk, great. Um, Thank you. I have many questions. Uh, one of which would be in these nice heterogeneous systems. So particularly if you modify your host material, can you achieve confinement control in the selectivity? Um, by sh changing the pore size, right, pore size. Yeah, it? well, we unfortunately we, we haven't done so much work on that. <clears throat> I think we should have we should have done it, but we haven't 
haven't. Mm. Uh, the only thing we have tried much smaller uh, pore sizes, and that doesn't work at all. So you need a certain size at least uh, maybe above 20, but it would be interesting to vary that, of course, yes. And the other question, I mean, there are two actually, but the, one is the, the difference between the, for the chiral phosphoric acid, so the going from the binaphtol to the bi arrow. Yeah. So if you further modify the bi arrow, you Ah, uh, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, I didn't show that. In my previous talks, I had time, I showed a lot of these, uh, the, the poor student had to synthesize a lot of binaphtyl phosphoric acids and suddenly one went up a little bit and then it went down again. So it was quite frustrating. But finally, when we found this biphenyl type, we were really happy that uh, gave the best results in the end. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great work. Shavik, please. Yeah, Professor Bagwal, very inspiring lecture, very nice chemistry and truly intriguing. So my I have two questions, so particularly one question is for say you have done the oxidation chemistry, dehydrogenation chemistry using oxygen, very nice chemistry. Do you think, okay. can you also fix oxygen into organic molecule by using the same principle? That means let's say hydroxylation chemistry. Okay, I see what you mean, CH oxidation with molecular oxygen or something. Mm -hmm. Is can that it, what you mean? Yes, exactly. Can that be possible? I, I think so. Uh, I mean, you can at least indirectly make CH oxidations uh, and then it, you could transfer the electrons to molecular oxygen or you could make it directly. We haven't focused so much on this direct interaction with molecular oxygen on CH bonds, but we have more, we have looked a little, I mean, most of these reactions are uh, truly CH activations, but I mean, we don't functionalize the CH site. We break the CH bond. So it's CH, um, it's not functionalization, but uh, CH activation. But if you wanted to make directly, no, we haven't done it actually. And my second question, is that possible to replace carbon monoxide using carbon dioxide? Because uh, you know my, <laughs> What is the reason? Of course, if we sure, can... yeah, 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 this... yeah. We we have, we have actually a project going on, uh, which I, I I couldn't talk about it because we have only preliminary results, and it it was actually Wei Jing Kong who came from um, with the electrochemistry knowledge. So we we actually reduce carbon dioxide at the cathode. Mm -hmm. And then we generate the carbon monoxide. And then we have at the anode, we, are, we do the oxidation chemistry. So the hydroquinone is oxidized to benzoquinone. Exactly. So we have actually a carbonylative carbon cyclization going on. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, we have shown that we can generate carbon monoxide and we can show that if we separately run we already generated carbon monoxide in the electrochemical system. Then we have a 65% yield. Yes. So that looks really promising, but we have not yet been able to do the reduction at the same time in one cell mm. with good yields. So it's, it's still too early to talk about it. Mm. Yeah, but, but it's already quite impressive since uh, this reductive functionalization of carbon dioxide is becoming so popular. Yeah, yeah. You see, if you open a journal like Jackson Angevant, uh, there yeah. are a lot, of, <laughs> yes, lot of papers on that. Indeed. Thank you very much for your... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chad. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward uh, uh, to this uh, paired electrocatalytic electrosynthesis uh, when, when this is, once this is published, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, um, yeah, so are there any further questions? This is not the case, I would say, uh, and we are also a little bit uh, behind uh, schedule, but this is totally fine. Uh, I think we all enjoyed the show today our, from our three speakers. So let's thank our three speakers once more for their really beautiful and uh, inspiring talks. And um, yeah, so it's time to close now. Um, yeah, uh, as Shubik mentioned in the beginning, this will be the last event of the series. 
uh, we all expect that the pandemic situation is going to end more or less soon. So at least we will be able to 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 make conferences more in in presence. And this is also the goal for for this lecture series. So again, this is the last uh, SCLS event uh, in the online mode. Yeah, and and hopefully in the future we can can offer some some real uh, event in the in the in the real world. So um, yeah, thanks all for tuning in. Um, that's, I hope that uh, we can all meet again in the, in the future, in the real world. Enjoy your evening. And Shubik, do you have anything to add? No? Then I think, yeah. Thank you all again Goodbye. very much for participating. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, yeah, for sharing your time with us and sharing your chemistry with us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We wish you a very nice evening. Same to you. Bye. Bye.